It is the requirement of locality. Notice, right? Not causality, which is the determinism part. It is the requirement of locality. Bell couldn't be clearer than this. Where does Copenhagen fall into this? Copenhagen falls into this as not being a clear theory. Okay, <laughs> I see. Okay. They're just not clear enough about what they're doing. <laughs> Despite it being textbook quantum mechanics. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Cartesian Cafe. I am your host, Tim Wynn. Today, we're very lucky to have Tim Maudlin here with us. Tim is a philosopher of science specializing in the foundations of physics, metaphysics, and logic. He is a professor at New York University, a member of the Foundational Questions Institute, and the founder and director of the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. Welcome, Tim. How are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm glad to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. Um, I thought we could start out by you telling us a little bit about your career trajectory. Uh, for myself, uh, when I was growing up, I always knew I wanted to do some combination of mathematics, physics, and philosophy. Uh, mathematics ended up being the more dominant of those three, but I, I feel that if circumstances or opportunities had been different, I, I could have easily done some other combination of the three. Uh, you ended up doing a combination of philosophy and physics. Uh, how did that come about? Well, this was just, I was one of those undergraduates who was interested in everything. Um, so I took a lot of different courses. When I when I started out, actually, I was, my intention was to become an architect. And I, my freshman year, I took courses in civil engineering. Um, and I, I took course, you know, I took a course on Bach. I took, I mean, I took all kinds of stuff. But there's a kind of cast of mind that naturally leads you into physics and into philosophy and into mathematics, actually, to, to, to an extent as well, which is a kind of foundational interest in a certain sense of foundational. Um, so I'd like to say there's a there's a sense in which it's it, it's not quite what many people think it is, but there is a sense in which People say, well, biology, that's just really fancy uh, cellular stuff. And cellular stuff, that's just fancy chemistry. And chem chem chemistry is just fancy physics. And once you get down to physics, that's not fancy anything else. That's the bottom level. Um, and that the laws of physics, for example, are supposed to be completely universal and exceptionless, whereas the principles of biology or economics or chemistry or whatever are not. Um, and so in a way, physical law is more rigorous or more objective than the principles that are used in other sciences. So there's a certain push downward in a certain sense of downward that leads you into, into physics. Um, that same push downward on any topic leads you into philosophy, sort of, well, what is this after all at base? Um, you know, what are beliefs after all, or, or you know, what what is the good after all, um, where you're not so much interested in the particular cases as in the fundamental principles. Um, and, and that will also uh, uh, lead you and led Plato into mathematics, because mathematics seems to have rigor in its proofs. It's a place where you can actually demonstrate things, where you can get at the truth and know you've gotten to the truth. So certain epistemological issues come up there. So I think math, physics, and philosophy, certain parts of philosophy form a natural group. Um, in the, in the, the John Bell Institute that I founded by charter, and I wrote the charter, um, there are six governors, and two have to be philosophers, two have to be physicists, and two have to be mathematicians, because all of these fields give you expertise that's relevant for doing foundations of physics. So it wasn't too much of a surprise that I was interested in both physics and philosophy. Lots of philosophers of science, their background is either in math or sometimes in logic. Um, and of course, if you're doing physics and you're interested in a foundational way, you get interested in math because math is the language in which physics is written. And then you need to think about how that works and how you can use mathematical objects to represent physical reality. It's a very subtle question. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can imagine going off in any of these directions. 
and being pushed a little bit about what you're just naturally best at. I mean, I was a pretty good physics student, but there were ones that were better, and there were certainly much better math students than me. <laughs> so I ended up getting my PhD, actually, in history and philosophy of science, which makes sense, and specializing in, in physics in that. That's great. Um, in, in terms of going further along in your career, now, now you're a professor, and uh, uh, you work at the, I guess, intersection of philosophy and, and, and physics. Uh, my experience with academia has been that it can be very, uh, let's say, compartmentalized. Right? To, have a, to, to, to be in academia, you need to be squarely in one department. You're, you're in the physics department or the philosophy department, and, and there can be kind of, you know, maybe very little interaction between the two, if, if at all. And it can be quite dangerous even to, to work at the intersection of the fields. If, if you're, uh, you know, the physicist might think you're a philosopher, the philosophers might think you're a physicist. So you can kind of easily fall through the cracks if you try to do uh, interdisciplinary work. Um, is that at all mitigated by being a philosopher of, of science? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's certainly mitigated in the philosophy department. I mean, it, it, it's certainly the case that you'll that physicists will look down not just on philosophers, but pretty much anybody who doesn't have a degree in physics, right? Um, I mean, that's the stereotype. And and there's you know, more than a smidgen of truth in it. So you have to overcome a certain attitude that physicists often have for somebody who, who, who doesn't have a, a, an official degree in the subject. Um, not the other way, really. That is, uh, philosophers are quite welcoming and they appreciate technical background. They understand that if you're going to do philosophy of science, sure, it's a really good thing that you understand the science and you've studied it. So it's it's not as if I've ever come across anybody in philosophy who said, oh, you know too much physics to be doing philosophy. <laughs> you know, that this sort of doesn't just doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and historically, of course, many philosophers were also physicists and mathematicians. I mean, Descartes and Leibniz and, I mean, Newton was doing natural philosophy and he's somebody we discuss. So there's not a, there wasn't a historical division there and, and contemporary philosopher, philosophy departments are, if anything, very welcoming to people who have technical backgrounds that seem relevant to philosophical questions. Um, much more than physics departments are welcoming to people who are have been trained to do a certain kind of conceptual analysis and clarity of argumentation, um, which is really what you get out of a out of a uh, philosophy training is a very self-consciousness about arguments and argument forms and where arguments can go wrong um, and what tacit presuppositions there are and what follows from what. Um, that's what a training, a good training in philosophy will make you very sensitive to. And I think that's why, you know, Einstein complained about the physicists of his time, that they didn't have enough philosophical background. Um, you know, Einstein, when he was young, they had reading groups reading Hume, and he appreciated philosophy, and he appreciated the kind of rigor that philosoph that good philosophers bring to their arguments. Um, of course, bad philosophers, it's the opposite. But yeah, such is the, yeah, the world. <laughs> yeah, lingering on that, that uh, interplay between physics and philosophy a, a little bit longer do you think in, in uh, today's climate there uh, with you know the current interaction or lack thereof between physics and philosophy do you do you feel that there, sh there should be more interaction it seems that einstein uh you know his philosophical thinking very much informed his his say formulation of uh general relativity and, and maybe his view of physics uh, at large um do you think the next breakthrough uh conceptual breakthrough in physics will will require maybe some some philosophical uh, considerations? I I mean, there are two parts to that. There, there's the kind of plain vanilla part that nobody should disagree with, which is that any such breakthrough requires really rigorous thinking, clarity of thought. Um, and unfortunately, that is sadly lacking in many physicists, even about things that aren't controversial. Um, I mean, 
sometimes I feel like if 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 by the time I give this up, if I can manage to just explain how the twins paradox works correctly, so people don't make mistakes about it, that would be an accomplishment. And there's nothing controversial about it, nothing really that hard about it. But but physicists physicists get it wrong all the time. I mean, Feynman got it wrong in his lectures, explaining what's going on in that case. Um, why? Not because there's anything really hard there, but they're just not careful enough. And they they kind of repeat what they've been told. This is the way most people work, is they don't really work out things and understand them. They kind of, if they hear it 10 times, then they'll repeat it the 11th time um, and think they understand it. <laughs> and that, that happens all the time. Now, the, you know, in, in relativity, the real experts in relativity understand all this. It's not news to them. In, in quantum theory, it's a mess. And even the people who would be considered to be the greatest experts are often completely confused um, and just conceptually confused. Um, and that needs to get cleared up. So it's much more that rigor of method that's needed here than philosophical insights in the sense of some big, I don't know, Kantian or Hegelian or whatever, you know, system that's going to clear all this up. That's not going to be it. But you certainly need to be more careful in argumentation and in understanding the fundamental principles of the theories that you're using. Um, and that has not been encouraged in physics departments for over a century, largely because of quantum mechanics. Hmm. Actually, uh, in a, in a uh, separate uh, conversation we had, uh, we were, you actually thought that maybe uh, current physicists were working on some, <laughs> some of the wrong problems. I don't know, you mentioned the black hole information paradox, things like that. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to comment on that as a, maybe a specific example that you oh, know, yeah. I mean, I a mean, wrong that's direction. A that, that, that's a case where what's going on? Everybody realizes correctly that there's a difficulty bringing together relativity and quantum theory. I mean, there's difficulties just at a mathematical level and there's difficulties at a conceptual level. And kind of grasping at straws for some way to make progress. And they hit on this idea, more or less quasi-accidentally, that, oh, I can describe black holes that, that the laws that govern black holes look kind of analogous to thermodynamic laws, right? So that was noticed by Hawking and, um, and so on. And then, and then that got pushed further. Oh, well, once you do quantum field theory on a curved manifold, you get this Hawking radiation. So really uh, there is a thermodynamic entropy to black holes. And then we can somehow have to think hard about black hole thermodynamics, that that's going to help us put together quantum mechanics and relativity. And I think that's just, that, 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 that's just pure desperation to begin with, because we have exactly zero empirical evidence about black hole thermodynamics and zero empirical evidence there even is Hawking radiation. Um, and very little, I, in my opinion, understanding of how the calculations that give you Hawking radiation work and what the principles from which it is derived are. And then you just kind of get this mess that's jammed together and all these people think, oh, if I can just calculate the, the number of possible interior states of a black hole and then calculate the black hole entropy, and if I can get that number to come out right, that shows I'm on the right track. I mean, string theorists have been saying this kind of stuff for quite a long time. And, and then doing calculations that everybody admits nobody can follow from beginning to end and kind of wheel in all these different weird principles and nobody can give you an intuitive explanation for how they work. And they say, but look, we got the right number at the end. It shows what? That string theory must be correct because it's giving us black hole entropy. I mean, th this is just, I mean, it's the kind of thing that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. It's just the kind of thing that picked up steam because it was something you could do. Um, there were kind of rules of the game, sort of quasi rules of the game. Um, but if you really step back and say, is the right way to understand how to put together relativity insofar as they can be put together, relativity and quantum theory going to run through the root of black hole thermodynamics, that just, 
that, that, that's just so off the wall um, and unconstrained, certainly by anything empirical. And you can't, I, I, I literally can't understand it. On the other hand, I mean, to give you the contrast, what do we know? We know we have experimental confirmation of violations of Bell's inequality. The, the, the Nobel Prize was just given for that experimental confirmation. That's a fact. That's an established experimental fact. And if you understand the significance of Bell's theorem, you're going to say, man, that gives me a real conflict with relativity right there. And a conflict that doesn't come out on relativity side, because general relativity could not predict violations like that. General relativity is a local theory in Bell's sense. And general relativity, taken as it was written down, could not possibly explain or account for or predict what you see in the lab with respect to violations of Bell's inequality. That's real hard stuff. I mean, that's not fantasy. That's out of the lab and with some very simple argumentation. So I think it would be much more fruitful for people to be thinking hard about getting non-locality into a theory that's still from which relativistic constraints emerge in some natural way. So you, 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 of course, you need to understand why relativity works as well as it does and why various relativistic principles have led to good predictions. Um, even though ev there's every indication that the fundamental picture of relativity can't really be right. Oh, very interesting. And I think that's maybe a good segue for us to get to the uh, main part of our discussion today. So uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Bell's theorem, which is uh, quite a remarkable theorem in that it's both uh, profound and overlooked at the same time. Uh, profound because it's a surprising and central result in the foundations of physics, but also overlooked because uh, it's not something you're taught in any standard physics course. I've never seen it advertised on a, on a physics syllabus. And so many a physicist can go through their entire career without ever uh, needing to think about uh, Bell's theorem. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's also kind of funny because mathematically, it's, it's quite a simple theorem. It's not, not at all difficult to prove. Uh, but the, the, the really difficult part is really getting the conceptual understanding correct. What are, what are the actual assumptions? Um, what are the different trade-offs if you try to vary the assumptions and, and maybe want to hold certain things to be true? Um, getting the terminology straight. Uh, and and th that's really where the difficulty lies. Um, and in fact, the difficulty is, is, is sufficient that um, even the Nobel Prize Committee, when they wrote the description for, um, for the uh, 2022 prize uh, for the work of Espe, uh, Klauser, and, and Zeilinger, when they described the significance of the prize, they, they also uh, messed it up. And I, I will get into that later. Um, so, so yeah, so, so Bell's theorem is, is quite funny for, for all these reasons. Um, maybe before we dive in and, and give an outline of what we're going to talk about, uh, I guess you sort of already alluded to it, but maybe uh, can you, get, can you just give us a summary of, of how to think about Bell's theorem, what, what it is, and why um, anyone should care? Sure. So the, the, the topic of Bell's theorem is locality. And you, you have to just <laughs> stop there and say that's what it's about. It's about, in, in particular, local causality in a certain sense that Bell makes clear. Sometimes people call it Bell causality. Um, it's not about just as as far as the misattributions of the of the Nobel Prize Committee. It's not about so-called hidden variables theories of quantum mechanics. That's what many people think. It's somehow th th they mistakenly believe that uh, the net effect of Bell was to rule out so-called hidden variables in quantum theory, and. The, the, the problem, I mean, there are many problems with that, but for anybody who doesn't believe there's a problem, here's an observation. The most famous hidden variables understanding approach to quantum theory is the de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory. And John Bell wrote a very nice paper called On the Impossible Pilot Wave, advertising the theory and he claimed elsewhere it's the best constructed theory. It has it shows the best craftsmanship of all the approaches to quantum mechanics. He says that in 
in quantum mechanics for cosmologists or in six possible worlds of quantum theory. One of those, he says, of these different approaches, you know, uh, Bohm shows the best craftsmanship. So people somehow managed to convince themselves that Bell had ruled out a theory that he himself, long after his proof, was advertising and supporting and promoting. And that should tell you right off the bat, you don't understand what Bell did. Uh, you know, he, he wouldn't be out advertising a hidden variables theory if he thought he had ruled out hidden variables theories, right? That just makes no sense. And it 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 wasn't his point. In fact, the point of the 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 theorem has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, and it has nothing to do because the, even the term hidden variables only makes sense in the context of quantum mechanics. And the theorem's not about quantum mechanics. It's about any theory that is locally causal. And by that, essentially, we can just say this, if you're if you're familiar with relativity, any theory in which all of the causes of an event lie in or on its past light cone. Okay, so let's just take that. I mean, we could get go into maybe much finer detail, but just take that. So take a theory where anything that could have a causal effect on a certain event is in or on its past light cone, which means that light at least would have would be able to get from the cause to the effect, right? So cause as as it were, causation can't go faster than light in the context of relativity. Um, that's a causally local theory. And and of course, in in that sense, for example, Maxwellian electrodynamics is a causally local theory. Um, and if all you had was Maxwellian electrodynamics, you would never predict violations of Bell's inequality. Um, that's not a quantum theory, and that has nothing to do with hidden variables. Uh, Newtonian mechanics is going to be causally local as long as causes only influence their effects by some process that doesn't go faster than light. Then it will be causally local. And what Bell shows is that there are constraints on the sorts of phenomena that a causally local theory can predict or account for. And then what you notice is that two things. The first is that quantum theory predicts violations of those constraints. That's very interesting. But more interesting and much more important is that you go into the lab and do some experiments. And irrespective of quantum theory, the experiments violate those constraints. The outcomes, the data from those experiments violate the inequality. And so that tells you, leave quantum mechanics aside entirely, that physics cannot be locally causal. Um, and it, to that extent, yeah, something, as it were, goes faster than light. It has to. Um, that brings immediately the tension with relativity into sharp focus. If you think that relativity forbids that, now you've got an absolutely clear tension there. Um, now you can argue, no, relativity doesn't really forbid it. Well, what really does relativity forbid? What really are the principles of relativity? What does really relativity say? Um, you can then get into a lot of detailed questions that are very interesting and very important. Um, my first book, quantum non-locality and relativity was just saying, okay, if, if you think relativity forbids something from going faster than light, just what is it that it forbids going faster than light? And then finally, maybe you don't think it forbids anything from going faster than light, then what does it do, right? What are the fundamental principles of relativity? And these are questions which can be asked and answered and investigated, but you have to have a, a, a very high premium on clarity and making distinctions and so on to do that kind of work. And often people don't. All right. And on that note, that's that's why we're making this episode so that uh, we can try to get the story I mean, I'll, I'll say one more word maybe that'll help people. It, sure. it is often, again, a mistake, commonly repeated mistake. It's well known that Einstein didn't like quantum theory as developed by Bohr and the so-called Copenhagen School. He really didn't like it. It is often mistakenly said that what he really didn't like was the indeterminism, the God plays dice stuff. But that's not what he really, really didn't like. What he really didn't like was the spooky action at a distance stuff, okay? 
what he called telepathy, that, that, the, that, that the Copenhagenists had to use telepathy to get their to get to get their predictions and he said he couldn't accept that that's non-locality that was really the issue from the beginning for einstein was that he saw quantum theory as exposited by bohr and heisenberg was non-local it had this spooky action at a distance and he couldn't accept that um so it's worthwhile you know to see that that the nub of the whole thing from the beginning was non-locality and that what Bell, what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were focused on in their paper in 1935 was non-locality, and what Bell is addressing is non-locality. Only yes. Bell's consequence is that you have to accept it, right? You can't <laughs> avoid it. So his his conclusion is anti-Einstein, but it's on the topic Einstein was worried about. So as you mentioned, we talked about Bell's theorem, but of course, to to properly understand Bell's theorem, we have to understand it in the context of the work of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. In fact, uh, you know, Bell's paper was called On the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen Paradox. Of course, we have to look at that first. So uh, anyways, let me, let me write down uh, what I think is, is going to be a, a, a suitable outline for us. And, and let's just, uh, well, let's just see how it goes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, as you mentioned, the sort of the prelude to this whole business, which is the uh, EPR paradox coming from Einstein, Podolsky, and uh, Rosen. Um, so that will set the stage for, for uh, therefore, uh, Bell's theorem. So we're going to look at it, I think, from, the, you know, try to, try to follow Bell's uh, paper, first of all, because, well, that's the source of the theorem. Uh, and, and uh, well, well, we'll go from there. And uh, we've been talking about Bell's theorem, but uh, Bell's theorem produces an inequality. There have been several versions of this inequality uh, going by various names, but, but they're all kind of collectively referred to as Bell's inequality. And so that will we'll get there when we talk about uh, Bell's theorem. Um, but uh, the thing with Bell's theorem is that it, the, the kind of inequality that you get from that paper is, is maybe not so um, easy to understand. Uh, it's not that intuitive. And what's really nice, uh, as I learned from talking to you in, in the book that you wrote, there's a simplification uh, that one can uh, implement. I'll call it the uh, GHZ version, named mm -hmm. after uh, Greenberger, uh, Horn, and Zeilinger. And what's nice about this version is that we can get a much more tangible um, feel for how Bell's inequality is violated um, in a way that the original paper doesn't make so clear. So, so it'll be very instructive, I think, to, to kind of do that. And, and it also separates a lot of sort of the extraneous kind of assumptions and, and, and you know, kind of uh, thoughts around Bell's theorem. It just disentangles things very, very cleanly. So, so it's, it's nice to do that. Um, I thought what we, what we could do after that is then maybe we could, now that we've kind of put all the technical details out there, maybe you could you could maybe um, uh, uh, state what exactly the 22 Nobel Prize uh, significance was. Um, yeah, you know, what, what, what it, they did in terms of the actual experiment or inequality that they, they showed was violated. Um, and then after maybe we do that, we can kind of uh, clean up a few things and talk about uh, misconceptions. You've already alluded to those uh, pertaining to Bell's and there's, there's, uh, there, there are a lot of them and, and they're persistent. So I think it's good to, 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 to really kind of uh, uh, make it clear what, what, what those misconceptions are. Um, and then sort of on a related note, there are also, well, once we've kind of um, explained things mathematically, we can also talk about what are really the necessary assumptions behind Bell's theorem. So Bell's theorem's necessary assumptions, as opposed to uh, maybe the uh, happenstance assumptions that, that people often describe Bell's theorem. And then we can therefore talk about, uh, uh, you know, and once we actually have the necessary assumptions, we can talk about say loopholes, things like superdeterminism and, and whatnot. Um, and then, just to round things out, we can maybe finish with, say, talking about uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. So, uh, yeah, a lot of lot of fascinating topics. Uh, uh, a lot on our plate today. Yeah, How let does me, this look? Let me, let me just make one correction. Okay, sure, of course. Here, uh, hold on, let me get my pen. Here, where you've written paradox, it's an argument. Ah, okay. <laughs> and this is... This is, you know, again, a point that Bell makes. They, they didn't regard that paper as producing a paradox. A paradox is something that you kind of don't know, you don't know what to make of it, right? Mm. Um, they thought 
No, th there's a very clear question before their mind when they write the paper. And it's the title of the paper, Is Quantum Mechanical Description of Reality Complete? So that it's just a question. You have a thing, a mathematical gadget called a wave function. And when you do quantum mechanics, you ascribe to any system a wave function. And the question they asked was, it, does that give me a complete description of the system? That is, if I know the wave function, does it somehow represent either directly or indirectly all of the physical characteristics of that system? Um, there are many ways to, to phrase this. One way to phrase it is, take any pair of systems that are given the same wave function. Are they physically identical? Are there, can there be any physical differences between them, right? Um, that, that that question either is yes or no. <laughs> and the whole paper is is arguing, no, it's not complete. That quantum mechanics, that that description, whatever it is, cannot be a complete description. It's got to have left stuff out. In, in the same way that, um, I mean, maybe this would be an analogy. If I have a box of gas, okay, it has a temperature, let's say, classically. But that's not a complete description of it because lots of boxes of gas that are different in their microscopic details can have the same temperature. Um, that's, you know, the, the temperature gets at something, but it sure doesn't get at everything because, you, have, you know, Avogadro's numbers of particles with particular positions and momenta and a complete description of that system would specify all of that. And if all I do is say, well, it's at 38 degrees centigrade, I sure haven't done that. Um, so there are various ways in which a description can fail to be complete. If it's complete, then you're saying physics is done, right? Somehow all the physics there is, I've, I've represented. There's nothing more to find. And, and what they were doing was arguing that quantum mechanics hasn't done that, right? And unfortunately, Bohr and so on were arguing that it had. I mean, it was they're, they're only making this argument in the context of the Copenhagen insistence that you can't go beyond what they'd done, that they'd reached the end of the road. Um, they'd gotten to the very bottom of things. And the very bottom of things was, first of all, not deterministic, and second of all, had various other characteristics of complementarity and so on. Um, that Einstein thought, no, I mean, why should I believe that? Why should I think that what you've done is, is the end of the story? And they were giving an argument that it isn't. Um, so that, that's what I, I want to say. If you say it's a paradox, <laughs> you would think at the end of the day, Einstein's scratching his head and saying, oh, I don't know what to make of this. But it's just the opposite. I know exactly mm. what to make of this, right? <laughs> okay. Quantum mechanics is not complete. I see. So, okay. Right? So, so I, let's say in contrast, I don't know, Zeno's paradox, where because they didn't have calculus, they didn't know how to think about it. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Zeno's paradox, exactly. You know, you, you, you hear Zeno's paradox say about, the, about Achilles and the tortoise. And you say, well, gee, this argument seems to suggest that Achilles can't catch the tortoise. But of course, Achilles can catch the tortoise, right? You don't, I mean, at the end of the day, you then say, yeah, now I understand, Zeno, that the fastest runner can't catch the slowest animal, right? So you're just, you, you know, something's gone wrong somewhere, um, but you don't quite know where. I mean, Einstein's not saying something's going wrong somewhere here. He's saying, I'll tell you where it's going wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I, well, the name stuck. So I don't know. I mean, uh, it, yeah, it yeah, is yeah, called yeah. the Epoch. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm not blaming yeah. you for that, but it, it is yeah, important yeah, right. to see quite sure. honestly. And I think this is why, again, I'm just channeling Bell here when he said mm -hmm. they didn't think it was a paradox. I think calling it a paradox already puts you on the wrong foot about what exactly it is. Mm. Right. Mm. And, and then if you're on the wrong foot at stage one, it's not going to get better going forward. Um, I think, you know, what what Bell saw was that. Was that from their premises, EPR provide a perfectly good argument. Mm. And he saw that one of their premises, although this one's a little buried, it's a little bit hidden, is a locality assumption. And so what he saw was, that, yeah, if you accept the locality assumption that's implicit in EPR, you better, you have to accept their conclusion, hmm. which is that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Sure. Okay. Why don't we dive into the, uh, what, what the EPR per, uh, argument is so, uh, so that we, now cool. we, we're going to start unfurling what these, what these uh, terms we've been talking about uh, mean. So uh, yeah, why don't we go to the next slide and maybe you can give your 
your formulation of the EPR argument. I know we've talked about this before that EPR sort of, well, they have the formulation in their paper. I know you like to think about it in terms of a simpler setup. I, I would agree with you because it's going to make things simpler later. So what, yeah, go ahead. Feel free to describe okay, it in the so, way that you think is most helpful. So the, 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 the place where locality is going to be buried uh, is, is in what EPR write down as a criterion of reality. Okay. And they're very careful also about their terminology here. So I'll just write, and I'm sorry again about my handwriting. Um, they're very careful about what, about their words. Okay. Then they say a criterion is not a definition. A criterion is a sufficient condition, but it doesn't have to be a necessary condition, right? That is, it, 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 I'm not, it would be a much bigger task to say, I'm going to, as it were, give you a complete definition of physical reality or of what it takes to know that something's physically real. I mean, they're not attempting such a thing. They wouldn't know what to do, but they're they're doing something much, much, much milder, but they think completely uncontroversial. And I think it is, what they say is completely uncontroversial. Um, so what do they say? They say, look, how do, how do I tell that there's some real physical characteristic or feature of a system? Well, suppose I'm in the following situation. Suppose they say, without in any way disturbing the system. So let's just put that, that's gonna be important, right? So without disturbing the system, I can do what? If without disturbing the system, I can predict with certainty how it will behave, right? So then you get can predict with certainty. So my predictions are never wrong, right? It's not a guess. This is with complete accuracy. Suppose the system is such that in, in this situation, I can predict with complete accuracy what it's going to do in some circumstance, say, if you, you know, subject it to some experiment, then there must be some element of reality in the system that makes it do that. I mean, there, there has to be something in the system that, that is going to be responsible for producing that behavior. Yes. I mean, if I can know what it's going to do and I'm not disturbing it, something in the system there is making it do that. That's the criterion. Right, so I can predict with certainty. Um, then the conclusion is there exists an element of reality. Can I just uh, uh, get a clarification here? Because we know, for example, that uh, we have indeterminism in quantum mechanics. But more generally, if you have a situation which of indeterminism, uh, could you state what this criterion? Well, it's the How same criterion. I mean, look, it might be that you're in a situation where you can't predict anything and therefore the criterion just doesn't apply. That doesn't mean okay. the criterion is wrong. It just means it's not useful. Okay. Okay. In order to apply it, I have to be able to make a, per, a, a perfect prediction. This, this, this means it's a very, it's a very narrow criterion. I mean, it's a very, it, 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 it doesn't apply in many, many, many cases. Interestingly enough, it applies in the, of course, it applies in the case that EPR analogs, right? They can apply it because they are in a situation where you can make perfect predictions under, under certain well-defined circumstances according to quantum mechanics. So all you're, all you're accepting here about quantum mechanics is its predictive accuracy. And that's something that even Bohr is not going to want to you know, throw overboard, right? Everybody's going to agree that the quantum, um, everybody, to, for this argument, it's taken for granted that these predictions of quantum mechanics are correct. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you're right. If, if, if I were to say, gosh, in my theory, I can't predict anything with certainty, then you'd say, well, then this argument will not get any purchase. So let's talk about the, now, now what, the, what happens to understand the history here is that when Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen write this paper, it, they're, they're doing a couple things, as far as I know, for the very first time, or anybody, any in any case, anybody paying attention. They're first of all looking at a system that involves a pair of particles that can be separated arbitrarily far apart. So as we now say, you create a pair of particles, your system is a pair of particles 
One is sent to Alice way over there. Another is sent to Bob way over there in their separate laboratories. And that's something you can do. Um, certainly according, you know, you just can do it. And in, of course, according to quantum mechanics, you can do it. So it's not really an issue, but you've got this pair of particles. And the only experiments that they're interested in are ones we call, and you have to be careful about this terminology, but we would call position measurements and momentum measurements. That's all they discuss. That is the only degrees of freedom in the system are position and, and, and momentum, not spin, not polarization. And the reason I'm saying that is that part of the history is EPR formulate their experiment with position and momentum. Later, David Bohm reformulates the argument for spin or polarization. And then Bell picks up the spin and polarization example because he can do things with it that have clear physical significance that you couldn't do at all with just position and momentum. I mean, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, you wouldn't know experimentally what you're talking about. So the transition to the spin example or the polarization examples that everybody uses now is important conceptually. Now, the next point to make is that even though Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen make their argument separately for position and for momentum, given the state they write down, it's really unnecessary for the argument. You can make the argument just looking at either just looking at position or just looking at momentum. And I think that's often a mistake that people make is they think it's really important that you can do both. It isn't. Um, rhetorically, it's useful that you can do both because it, it, it gives you something to shoot at Heisenberg uncertainty relations. Um, but that's not, but, but the conclusion that the quantum state is incomplete, which is the main conclusion follows just from thinking about either momentum or position. So let me do it just for momentum. Okay. So are we all, sure. if we're all on the same page, we're going to simplify this down. So what do we have? We have two particles. They're prepared in a certain quantum state, which they write down the EPR state. Particles are sent off to two different labs, arbitrarily far apart. Now, what is the characteristic of this quantum state? It's what we would now call an entangled state, although that terminology didn't exist at the time. And it's a state of, of net total, we would say total momentum zero. So the, the momentum of the pair of particles, for sure, if you check both particles, if you, as we say, measure their momentum, the total momentum will be zero, which means whatever momentum one shows up with, the other will show up with the opposite, right? If Alice's is, is going at a certain velocity in this direction, Bob's is going, I mean, they're equally massive. Bob's is going at the same velocity in exactly the opposite direction, okay? That's the important thing, is that, that there will be, according to quantum theory, a perfect correlation, or in this case, anti-correlation, between the outcome of Alice's momentum experiment and the outcome of Bob's momentum experiment. And they know that. They know that because they know how it has been prepared. Now it turns out, and again, this is just a, a, on the side, it's also true for position measurements. That is, if at a certain time, Alice makes a position measurement on the basis of her outcome, she can predict perfectly the outcome of Bob's if he's making the same kind of position measurement. So you can make the same argument either just for position or just for momentum. I'm just gonna use momentum because it's easier. It's actually mathematically simpler. Sure, More and I think math, math, just, to, just to write a formula to ground what you just said, I think basically what you wanna write is something like this. So your wave function psi will basically be a superposition of states that look, uh, that look like the following. You have say, I'm just gonna use you know, uh, ket notation, because that's uh, just easier yeah. to write instead of uh, all the variables that you don't really need to write down. But there's like, basically P of Alice, and let's say tensored with minus P of, of Bob, say, mm -hmm. and then you could just take a, you know, a superposition, a sum or an integral of them, depending on how you yeah. want to think about it. But that's basically for, what, for what all the different P's, right, for right. all these different, right. So, so if you ask, quantum mechanically, given how this pair of particles was prepared, 
can I predict with certainty what Bob will see, what result he'll get? Answer, no. There's a whole range of different results he could get. And quantum theory will give you probabilities for each thing in that range. There's a whole range, an equal range, but in the opposite direction for what Alice could see. Right. So That's represented the by theory, this, the sum here. The sum here yeah. tells you what that range is. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the, the theory does not make a strict prediction for either what Bob will see or what Alice will see. But the curious thing is it does make with certainty a prediction that whatever Alice sees, Bob will see the opposite and vice versa, right? This is the, this is the source of the puzzle. Because what we, we get these, so let me just write down what you get. And again, you don't need this for, for a bell inequality, but it makes the argument simpler if you have it. You have perfect correlations, right? You have predicted, sorry, let's write that down. Perfect correlations. So here's something, here's something absolutely nobody can possibly object to. If the predictions of quantum theory are correct, then... If if Bob makes a does a momentum experiment in his lab, once he sees the outcome of his experiment, he is now in a position to, with perfect accuracy, predict what the outcome of Alice's similar experiment will be. Whatever he sees, he knows she's going to see the opposite. He doesn't know before he does his experiment what he's going to see, but he knows whatever it is, it's going to you know she's going to see the opposite. That's right. So That's if right. we look up at at at, at the criterion of reality, we've got the can predict with certainty part, right? Mm -hmm. Bob mm -hmm. can, once he's done his experiment, he can predict with certainty what Alice will see. Yes? Mm -hmm. Now, the only other part of that criterion of reality is without disturbing the system. That is, did Bob, by doing his experiment in his lab, in any way disturb the actual physical state of Alice's particle? Yes. Now, Alice can be 100 billion billion miles away. It's here that that in a kind of tacit way, they think it's so obvious they don't even say it. This is where locality comes into the EPR argument. They just thought it's obvious that if Alice and Bob are, are, are in their labs and they're sufficiently isolated from each other far apart, and maybe even light doesn't have time to get from Alice to Bob or Bob to Alice in doing these experiments, then clearly, whatever Bob does, he's not disturbing Alice's particle. That's the locality assumption. Yes? So let, let, let me just uh, write one, one more thing. So basically what's going on here is that, uh, let's say Alice is going to uh, make a measurement of momentum, right? And then she's gonna get, let's say some value P star. And as soon as you do that, uh, you're gonna collapse the wave function onto now uh, this, uh, vector, which is just P star tensored minus P star. And since Alice and Bob are very far away, they could not have disturbed each other. Nevertheless, there's now this perfect correlation between the, the measurements that they've gotten. Yeah, I mean, right? I, I mean, what you say is perfectly correct. And people who understand that will follow it. But the main question, and this was the question Einstein had from the beginning, from the 1920s, was when you talk about collapse of the wave function, is that a physical thing? Or is that merely an epistemic thing, right? When you collapse the wave function, do you think that that is literally a physical change in something or is that merely getting information? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the, what, what bothered Einstein was that he thought they had to treat it as a physical effect. And if it's a physical effect, then Bob, by doing some experiment in his lab, has a physical effect on Alice's particle because Alice's particle goes from being in a state of indefinite momentum to a state of definite momentum. That's a physical change, right? And that would be spooky action at a distance. That would be telepathy. That would be the, the very thing Einstein couldn't believe in, that, that Bob, by doing something in his lab, has any physical effect at all on Alice's particle. But if you take the collapse as a physical event, it does. Because the normal thing would be to say, oh, Bob does his experiment, then I collapse the wave function. The collapsed wave function is now different with respect to Alice's particle, right? So you've changed Alice's particle state. And Einstein thought that's crazy, right? That's 
spooky action at a distance. That's telepathy. That's non-locality. So their assumption is, no, 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 no. All, all Bob does is find out about his particle. And on the basis of what he finds out, he now knows something new about Alice's, but nothing has physically changed. Now, Bell uses this example of Bertelmann's socks to get this across. So let me just talk about the example for people who haven't read. There's this wonderful paper, Bertelmann's Socks and the Nature of Reality, which is a funny title. And it's a funny paper, but um, you know the the physicist Bertelmann, who was a friend of, of of Bell's, apparently actually, as a matter of fact, for whatever reason, decided he would always wear socks of different colors. Um, so he gets up in the morning and he puts on a pair of socks, and you can't really predict what color any sock will be, but you can predict if you know Bertelmann, they'll be different. So if you see one sock and it's pink. Now you know something you didn't know about the other sock, namely it's not pink, right? Because there's a perfect correlation there. But again, there's nothing spooky about that. There's no action at a distance. There's nothing like seeing one sock suddenly changes the color of the other sock. No, no, no. They had their colors all along, right? They had their colors since he put them on in the morning. And all you're doing is finding out something you didn't know, which is what color is on the right foot. And when you find that out and you know also about Bertelman, you now know something new about the color of the sock on the left foot. But you didn't disturb the left sock, right? You're looking at the right sock, did not change the state of the left sock. And Bell's point is that that's the way Einstein thought about all this. He thought there's nothing at all puzzling about these correlations. If you think they have their momenta all along, if you think, Bob's particle and Alice's particle already had the momentum when they were created, one P and one minus P. And maybe, you know, if you do the experiment many times, you'll get a range because the experiment doesn't prepare exactly the same, right, state every time, but it always prepares a state where one is the opposite of the other. Then all of this is very easy to explain and there's no spooky action at a distance. But suppose you deny that. Suppose you say, no, 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 when the particles were created, they had neither of them had any particular momentum at all. Then you have two puzzles, right? One puzzle is why when I do what I call a momentum measurement, I get any result because you're telling me it didn't have any momentum coming in. And maybe there you, you, you even say, oh, it's really indeterministic, right? There's nothing that explains why you got this result rather than another. Any of these results could have come out. But then you have the much deeper puzzle. How does the other particle know what the first one did? And this is what you know. Bell says in this paper. He says it's, it's as if a child had had asked. But when you look at you know, suppose you think the socks don't have any color at all until you look. He says how does the second sock know what the first sock did? When I looked at it, right. So there, there's a connection between the indeterminism and the non-locality. If you have this perfect correlation. And there's anything indeterministic on one side, then you need telepathy or action at a distance to communicate that result or to restrict re the result on the other side so it always comes out different for the mm -hmm. side. What you're saying is that basically if you have indeterminism, which is what we have in, in, in quantum mechanics, right. um, and you have uh, perfect correlation, perfect then that requires spooky action at a distance. Right. Okay. Right. And then we can just turn that around and say, if you have perfect correlations with you, which you do, and you don't want spooky action at a distance, then you can't have indeterminism, right? Then you infer it has to be a deterministic theory. Sorry, because could you repeat that? Says, if there was any residual indeterminism, it would just spoil the perfect correlations, right? Sorry, I, I was busy writing. Could you could you repeat that uh, last part? Sorry. So yeah. So you, you've got. Mm -hmm. Indeterminism plus perfect correlations implies spooky action at a distance. Mm -hmm. and logically, that's equivalent to giving you correlations plus no spooky action at a distance, right? Okay. Gives okay. you no indeterminism. That is, gives you determinism. Okay. Sorry. Those Perf are logically uh, equivalent. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's modus ponens, modus tollens. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Perfect correlation. I'm just, I'm just being dense here. Perfect writing. correlation. Yeah, plus 
Plus, no spooky action at a distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. Okay. So let's just say. Okay. So locality. Yeah. No. No. Mm -hmm. No action at a distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Implies determinism. I believe you said. Implies right? determinism. Yeah. Okay. And that's where I mean I have this quote. Mm -hmm. We've in in Berylman socks because it's I I think it's very important. Y you have to hear. Bell's own personal frustration here, right? Um, so he says, uh, this is on page 143, if anybody has, has this <laughs> version. Uh, it's important to note that to the limited degree to which determinism plays a role in the EPR argument, it is not assumed, but inferred. Right, it's not an it's not an axiom; it's a theorem. Right, it's not something he starts with; it's something he arrives at. What is held sacred, right? What really is the fundamental axiom or the fundamental principle held, is the principle of local causality or no action at a distance. Of course, mere correlation between distant events does not by itself imply action at a distance but only correlation between the signals reaching the two places. So if you, you, you can imagine setting up these cases where, yeah, um, you, you have a signal that, you know, that's sent out to, to, to Alice on one side and Bob on the other. And, and when Alice gets hers, she knows what Bob's going to get. Or people say, you know, tear a dollar bill in half and send one half out to Alice and one half out to Bob. They don't know which one's coming. But once one sees theirs, they know what the other one is, right? That's... There's no spooky action at a distance in that. He says, um, these signals in the idealized example of Bohm must be sufficient to determine whether the particles go up or down. Now we're going to repeat this for spins. For any residual indeterm indeterminism could only spoil the perfect correlation. Right? If if whenever the particle gets to Alice, something really indeterministic happens, and that result cannot be communicated to Bob, then Bob can't always get the opposite result, right? I mean, that whole paragraph is it. If you read that paragraph carefully, you see, first of all, the main thing is EPR do not assume determinism, they derive it. They, what do they derive it from? They derive it from the perfect correlations, which are predicted by quantum mechanics and a principle of locality, right? And that's what you have to understand. Bell, Bell understood, and he kind of assumed that anyone who read the EPR paper would understand that is a good inference. Now, how do you get out of it? Well, it's easy to get out of it if you don't like action at a distance. You just have to deny the completeness of quantum mechanics because you say, no, 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 you know, in this experiment, when Bob got this particular value and Alice got that particular opposite value, those were determined from the beginning. And in the next experiment, when Bob got this different value and Alice got this different opposite value, that was also determined from the beginning. But the quantum mechanical states that you use in both cases are the same. But that means the quantum mechanical states were not complete. There was more information. There was more stuff going on. And that stuff, extra stuff, was what determines the outcomes, right? That was already determined at the source what the outcomes would be. And sure. but but the quantum state used to make these predictions does not give you that. So it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. That was their total conclusion. They said, look, quantum mechanics is not giving you the whole story. The only way to maintain it is is to is to buy this spooky action at a distance and take this wave collapse seriously as physical as a physical event rather than just conditionalization on new information. I mean, one way to put it is the only way you can conditionalize on new information is if there's new information you didn't know from the beginning, right? If you already knew sure. everything, you can't get new information. You knew the wave function of this pair of particles. If that's all there was to them, then you can't get new information about them because there is no new information about them. Sure. Let me right. let me make a few comments just to kind of maybe um, sure. summarize and state where we are right now. So the, the first thing we uh, observed in terms of what we talked about in the previous slide, and, and which can be thought of in terms of wave collapse, uh, was, was this first thing that I'll start right here, indeterminism plus perfect correlation equals 
uh, non-locality. Uh, and this is, this is logically equivalent to this reformulation down here. And this reformulation is the, is the EPR argument, right? That, that is the conclusion of the paper, that mm -hmm. uh, perfect correlation and locality, which they want to keep, uh, leads to determinism. And uh, well, they, they don't say it in those words. What, they, uh, what we mean here by determinism in the language of EPR is that the wave function is incomplete, right? The, the quantum wave function. Right. That's right. So that, that's the way EPR you know, the, the formulated question that point. Of the, the, the again, the title of the paper is, is quantum mechanical description of reality complete? Mm -hmm. And the answer they offer is no. <laughs> and, 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 and furthermore, that the only way out of that conclusion is to embrace this spooky action at a distance, which they mm -hmm. just regard as being insane. I mean, I mean, they certainly think if you're going to embrace that, you better have a better reason <laughs> mm -hmm. than has been offered here, right? Because this is a huge thing you're taking on. And I can easily give you a local theory that will make all these predictions, right? I can easily give you a local theory where Alice and Bob always get opposite momenta. And Alice and Bob also, if they do position measurements, can now predict the other one's position measurements without any spooky action at a distance. I just predetermine both what the momentum and the positions will be. Now, at that point, you know, you run into the in, in, into the Heisenberg uncertainty relations and you can make a kind of slightly sharper point and say the quantum mechanical formalism doesn't even contain a state of definite position and definite momentum, right? I mean, there's no such, even mathematically, the, the, the formalism of the theory doesn't allow for such a thing a state that has a perfectly well-defined momentum and a perfectly well-defined position. So, of course, if you say, well, the way to get out of this non-locality is to pre-assign a momentum and to pre, you know, to predetermine the positions, then you're just going to have to go beyond quantum formalism. But that's okay. That's just because quantum formalism is incomplete. It's a kind of, I mean, Einstein always thought that quantum formalism was more like a statistical description of a system which is an incomplete description or, or say a thermodynamic description. As I said, if I, give you the, if I give you the temperature of a box of gas, I'm telling you something about it, but I'm certainly not telling you everything about it. Um, yeah, let me, let me just say what maybe uh, another thing here, because I know it took, it's also, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's taken me a while to kind of get used to this language, but in terms of uh, maybe another way to illustrate this last point here at the bottom, right? If we think about it in terms of coin flips, Right, this the thing about determinism versus indeterminism. If every time I flip a coin, let's say I get heads, you get tails, or right. if I get tails, you get heads. There can't right. be any indeterminism because if there was still some randomness left in, in your coin flip result, then there's no way we could always get opposites. Right. So the only way for us to get opposite coin flips is if there's a deterministic connection that always guarantees right. the opposite result. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Right. So let's just think about this case. I mean, this is a perfect case. I give, I give you a coin, I take a coin. We go just go separately in our labs and flip our coins and, and we record the results and we see no pattern, right? It just looks random. Each of us is getting heads half the time and each of us is getting tails half the time. And we, there is no algorithmic pattern to H, the H's and T's. Um, so both of us say, well, maybe this is really a random coin. I mean, really, really an indeterministic random coin. Every time you flip it, there's just a 50% chance it comes up heads and a 50% chance it comes up tails and nothing is determining that. But then when we get back together, we notice that whenever you got H, I got T. And whenever I got, you know, you got T, I got H, that there's this perfect anti-correlation. Then the natural result said, well, they can't be completely random in that way. Now, there are two things that could happen. It could be that from the beginning, your coin was programmed to come up T, T, H, you know, blah, blah, blah. And mine was programmed to come up with the opposites. That would do it. Or maybe one of the coins really is random, but somehow when yours comes up heads, it can communicate telepathically to my coin, even though my coin is very far away. And instantaneously, hey, I came up heads. You come up, you know, you, you come up tails. That would do it too, right? Then you would, as it were, have a little bit of indeterminism together with a, a causal connection that's keeping them tallied, right? Those would work. But once you notice that the, that the streams on the two sides are perfectly correlated, you got to, that's something you need to explain. Sure, sure. I mean, and let's, let's just pause here. So in, in, the, in the way that EPR are thinking about it, 
if this were the coin flip scenario, they, they would reject the communication between the coins and say, wait, these That's coins right. are actually determined, right? Exactly. They would say, right. look, if you can, it, all right, we have one hypothesis. They would say, yeah, this is a hypothesis that they're communicating with each other. How can we rule that out? Well, let's just take them further and further apart. Let's put them in rooms further and further apart. First of all, even if they were communicating by, I don't know, radio waves or whatever, the, the signal should get weaker and weaker, right? Because I'm separated. But also now, if you really want to be sure, flip them at the same time, or as we would say, it's space-like separation. So even if they had were jam-packed with radio transmitters and radio receptors, there wouldn't be enough time for a signal to get from Alice to Bob or Bob to Alice. Then it's hopeless, right? They, they would say, I mean, then you need to violate relativity. You have to have the information get there faster than light. So they would say, of course, even, even if you can't quite figure out how these things are being predetermined. Now it's not, it's of course not so bad because in the, in the case they have, it's not like there's just, I give you one coin and give me one coin and we keep flipping the same coin. We do it every time on a fresh pair of particles. So all you need is to say, okay, this pair of particles is prepared. So this one will come tails and that one will come heads. The next one is prepared. So this one will come heads and that one will come tails, right? I don't need, but you know, in each case you say, look, the, the preparation procedure just predetermined what they were gonna yield and predetermine them to be opposite and nothing spooky is going on at all, right? It's just mm -hmm. the particles bring that information with them when they get there. Yeah. But it um, has to be deterministic, right? They have to yeah. bring enough information so each one knows what to do, right? Sure, sure. So Maybe just as an aside, and I, I, think, I think we've probably uh, well, uh, stated the EPR uh, uh, argument by now, but let me, let me just kind of linger on this determinism for, for a second here, because it's, I think there's something interesting uh, maybe uh, g going on here in the sense that um, so, 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 so we all learn uh, at the very beginning uh, in, when we learn about quantum mechanics that the results are not deterministic. When I measure the momentum or position, I'm going to get some distribution of values. Um, now, it's interesting that that in and of itself um, is not something that Einstein was upset about or wanted to, uh, to, to counteract. But in the end, he does get this conclusion of determinism, not from vanilla quantum mechanics, but from this coupling of the two particles experiment that we just did, where there's now uh, a potential non-locality. And it's by sort of opposing that, that you end up getting determinism. But it's not, determin it's not opposing determinism in and of itself when you first introduce the axioms that's and the wave collapse. It's, it's, it's the outcome of this. So it's, it's actually kind of I think that's worth noting. It's it's, not, it's, not, but, it's but very indirect. Right. I mean, the, the, yeah. the thing that EPR bring into this discussion, which is novel, is this entanglement between distant particles. That's right. That's right. It's standard quantum mechanics. It's just nobody had thought about how to apply, how standard quantum mechanics applies to a pair of particles where each of the, par the particles have been well separated from each other. Yeah. Right? So, so and what Einstein realizes is wait, just standard quantum mechanical technique allows you to write down what we now call these entangled states mm -hmm. where you can predict these correlations out of these entangled states, even though you can't predict the particular values. Now, the word correlation gets so abused here. Many people will say um, the following thing, which is kind of incoherent. They would say, in the state that they write down, EPR, neither particle has a momentum, but the two momenta are correlated or anti-correlated. And this is just it kind of syntactically doesn't make sense. You know, if, if, if something doesn't have a value for its momentum, you can't say it is correlated or anti-correlated with something else that doesn't have a value. <laughs> I mean, you can say correctly that the, the physics is such that if I do a momentum experiment on both sides, the outcomes will certainly be correlated or anti-correlated. But you can't say that, that a, a system that doesn't have a value for some quantity, also that value is correlated or anti-correlated with something else that doesn't have a value, right? It just, it makes no sense. I mean, it's just literally gibberish to say that. But people say that all the time. They say, oh, it's, it's not so puzzling because the, the entangled state is correlated. No, it's not correlated. 
right? It's entangled and it predicts correlations. But if you say the state doesn't actually have a momentum, you can't say the momentum is correlated with anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean maybe it's just a, a wording issue, but of course what they really mean, I'm just, I'm back on, on the uh, second slide now, is that it's a superposition of these perfectly sure. correlated states. Yeah, yeah. Any, anyways, yeah. Uh, let's not get boggled with the semantics. We're gonna maybe have many more opportunities for that, which will be more meaningful. But uh, yeah, so I guess just, just, just to uh, wrap this up, I think the, 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 the point I was trying to make, and, and I guess you agree, is that um, if you were only dealing with the quantum mechanics of a single particle, no entanglement, then there would be right. no argument against determinism. And you would just right. have indeterministic quantum mechanics for a single right. particle state. It's only right. when you bring in the second particle, use entanglement, you get this uh, non-locality phenomenon. And then you, if you're EPR, you say, no, we, we don't allow right. that. And though we have to get determinism. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Because if you have only a single particle, I'll just say a word for people to understand this. The only condition where I can make a prediction with certainty if, if it's already in an eigenstate, right? But if it's in an eigenstate, then I can read that off of the quantum state, right? So I don't have to say the quantum state is incomplete because the quantum state just is an eigenstate. You say, oh yeah, that gives me the information already. Mm -hmm. So you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have any latitude to argue for the incompleteness of the quantum state if you only had a single particle. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, all right. I think this now sets the stage for um, Bell's response to this EPR argument, right? So, so the EPR argument, just to again summarize, that's that's basically kind of this box here that we've sort of discussed at length now. Um, okay, why don't we pick up with now how Bell ent enters into the story? Good. So, and and let me do an intermediate step. I mentioned this before. EPR paper: the discussion is only of position and momentum measurements. So kind of the only experimental setups you would even discuss in that paper are, you know, what we call a position measurement, what we call a momentum measurement, whatever they are. As I said, you could really just do it with one set. What, between that, when, when, when David Bohm writes his textbook on quantum theory, he takes the same setup, but rewrites it for spin, for the quantum mechanical property of spin. What year is this, by the way? So you, EPR was 35. What was... Yeah, um, well, his textbook came out in 51, I think. Okay. Bohm. Okay. Okay. Because Bohm, Bohm produces this textbook called Quantum Theory. I, he's, at, he's an assistant professor at Princeton. He would like to discuss it with Einstein. I mean, there's this famous story. He really would be interested in discussions. He's kind of scared. He doesn't know Einstein. He's trying to find somebody who can ask Einstein and he gets a letter from Einstein just out of the blue and says, I read your book. It's a really interesting book. Come talk to me about it. And, and that's 19, that must be 1952, I think, because it, 1951, 1952, because after that conversation, and uh, again, Bohm writes this book, which is very much in the Copenhagen style. It's an exposition of quantum theory from the point of view of Copenhagen. And Einstein says, this is the clearest exposition I've ever read. I think you've done a really good job of clearing out a lot of the obscurities, right, of what Bohr was trying to say. But I still have problems. And 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 Bohm goes to talk to him for an afternoon, not more than a couple hours. And he famously comes back, I think his, I think actually his roommate was Gelman, or anyway, he was talking to Gelman, who was also young. And he comes back after that and he says after this, he says, I'm back to square one. Einstein has completely convinced me, you know, this is on the wrong track. And I assume that it was exactly the discussion of non-locality. Anyway, with then by 1952, he's already written this paper, quantum mechanics in terms of hidden variables of the pilot wave theory, which is a deterministic theory, deterministic non-local theory. Um, that's what wakes up Bell. That was, you know, the the that that's what awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers was. <laughs> You know, he was told when he learned quantum mechanics, Bell, well, yeah, it's kind of weird, but you might think there's a deterministic theory that could give you these results, but there isn't. And that was supposedly proven by von Neumann. And um, Bell at the time didn't read German. And he couldn't check what von Neumann had written. And he says he just put it out of his mind. He said, well, that's strange. I don't, you know, <laughs> he says, I guess, 
you know, the, the normal thought would be a kind of Einstein's thought. Maybe quantum mechanics is more like just a statistical theory because it deals in incomplete descriptions. Um, and it's only giving you statistical predictions because it's not taking everything into account. Yeah. And, and Bell raises this with his professors and the professors assure him that von Neumann has proven no such theory could give the same predictions. And then Bell says he he one fine day in 1952, he wakes up and reads Bohm's paper. And he says, Bohm has just done what I was told was impossible. I mean, I can see in this paper, he has produced a deterministic theory that makes exactly the same predictions as standard quantum mechanics, right? So he immediately knows that what he was told as an undergraduate was untrue or as a graduate, it was just untrue, it was just false. Um, it takes him a while to get hold of an English translation of von Neumann. When he does, he very quickly puts his finger on the assumption that von Neumann makes that he says is unphysical and kind of a silly assumption to make. Foolish, he says. Foolish assumption. Oh, what, what is that assumption? The assumption is that the, it, you, so you have these operators, right? So in quantum mechanics, you have these Hermitian operators that are associated with what are called observables, like position and momentum or spin in different directions. And those operators mathematically are related to each other by certain mathematical operations, okay? They're linear combinations of each other. And what von Neumann assumes is that if there is an additional quantity that's determining the actual outcomes, that those quantities have to be related to one another in the same way that these operators are related to one another mathematically. And it's easy to see that can't work. And Bell says, you know, you see immediately off the, but there's no reason for that to be true. There's just no reason to believe that these additional quantities that you're going to introduce have to have the same mathematical relations among them as these Hermitian operators have among them. So you can see it's a very clear assumption, right? Mathematically, it's a clear assumption. It's just physically, it makes no sense. It's not a natural assumption physically. If, for, for example, if two if two Hermitian operators are some linear combination, right? If, if, if a third operator can be written as a linear combination of two of these Hermitian operators, then the associated underlying values that determine the outcomes of the experiments, these new things I'm introducing, they have to be mathematically related to each other in exactly the same way. The other things are these additional variables that go beyond the quantum description that oh. actually determine the outcomes. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. I, I, there's, okay. I think they're just not in the normal part of quantum mechanics that I'm-, I'm No, no, these are the things that people mistakenly called hidden variables. They're just additional variables. I mean, go again, go back to EPR. EPR says, look, the quantum state is incomplete. Okay, then to complete it, I need additional variables, right? I see, to okay. To complete it, I need to add some stuff. And I'm going to add stuff that actually determines the outcomes of these experiments, right? The experiments are already associated with these Hermitian operators, but that doesn't predict exactly what will happen. That only gives me statistical predictions, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to add some variables that determine the actual outcome, but they don't have to be mathematically related to each other in the same way that the Hermitian operators are mathematically related to one another. So anyway, I mean, what, what, whatever it was, you know, Bell says, look, I just have a counterexample. I mean, von Neumann can't, can't have proven that a so-called hidden variables theory is impossible. A deterministic, in fact, a deterministic hidden variables theory is impossible because I have one in front of me. Here it is. <laughs> you know, it makes the same predictions. Bell, you know, Bohm proves it in this paper. So von Neumann made a mistake. Or at least, I mean, some people try to defend von Neumann. Certainly everybody understood that's what von Neumann had proved. And this was just a counterexample. Now, the thing about the theory that Bohm writes down, which was already de Broglie had the idea back in 1925. So this is not a new theory. It's and 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 Einstein himself had been fooling around with theories like this in the interim, we know, but he never accepted them. Why not? On its face, this thing is non-local. I mean, there is explicit, in your face, spooky action at a distance in the dynamics of this theory. So of course, if Einstein looked at that theory, he would see the theory, but he would say, that's not the kind of theory I'm looking for. I'm looking for a local theory. This is a manifestly non-local theory. 
But it is a deterministic theory. It's a theory where there's no fundamental randomness at all. The outcomes of all the experiments are already determined from the initial state and the dynamics. So Bell asks himself the question, huh, I wonder if I can do what Bohm did, only get rid of the non-locality, right? I know I can have a deterministic theory that gives me all the right predictions. The one I've got in front of me is also non-local. Can I actually eliminate the non-locality in the way that Einstein wanted? Mm. Let me then, let me just write this down. Have what Einstein wanted all. Along. Yeah. So so basically, Bohm. Uh, just write. So, uh, Bohm, right? He eliminated indeterminism. Mm -hmm. But there's still, uh, it still has non-locality. Right. And now, Bell comes along and says, "Oh." Can I get rid of, no, uh, well, I, I don't know how you phrase it, but get rid of non-locality? Is that okay? Can I, get, can I have a theory like Bohm's in the sense it's deterministic? I mean, look, Einstein had already proven in the EPR paper, if you want locality, you need determinism, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Bohm gave him determinism, but he didn't, he didn't get rid of the non-locality, right? It's a deterministic but non-local theory. There's still non-locality. And so, of course, it's going to occur to you, but wait, if, I'm, if it's a deterministic theory, I can, at least in principle, I can get the EPR correlations without any non-locality. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. kind of trivial. That's like Bertelman's socks. Just predetermine the outcomes and predetermine them so they're always the opposite. Yes? Yes. So, so, so Bell says, but now, can I, as it were, do something like what Bohm did? Get me, get, give me a deterministic theory. There's no longer the EPR argument that you need non-locality. So can I do a full theory that gives me all the quantum mechanical predictions, but is is local and therefore local and deterministic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the problem that he has in front of him. But notice, it's not again, it's not because you care about determinism. It's because you care about locality, and you already knew if you wanted to hang on to locality, you had to go to determinism. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the part where EPR infer determinism. They don't presuppose it. They infer it from locality. So he says, I wonder if you can do this, have do this and get all the quantum mechanical predictions. Now, the advantage that that Bell Bell had that Einstein didn't have, certainly at the time of EPR, was was because Bohm has reformulated this in terms of spins he's got a whole bunch of new experimental conditions to think about. So um, the way to put it is this. If, if In the EPR case, the only experiments you talked about, even in principle, were momentum and position. And the whole point that Bohr makes is that if you set up your lab to do a momentum experiment, you can't simultaneously do a position experiment because the experimental conditions exclude each other. If you do one, you can't do the other right? You can't check both for position and momentum at the same time. This is the basis of complementarity. Uh, so as far as Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen are thinking, Alice and Bob each have only two choices. They either check position or they check momentum. And so either they're both checking the same thing or one's checking one, one's checking the other. Th those are the only conditions they could think about. But now, You've got spin. Now, the thing about the spin experiment is that to measure spin of a particle, you measure it in a certain direction in space. And there's a continuum of directions you can choose. You can choose, you know, there, there are infinitely many directions you can choose. So in terms of the experimental condition between Alice and Bob, you not only have that they could measure spin in the same direction and say measure in orthogonal directions, one Z and one X, but they can measure offset by 45 degrees or 30 degrees or 60 degrees or 10 degrees or five degrees, okay? They're all, of, there's a continuum of different experimental situations. And quantum mechanics makes predictions about the correlations you ought to see between these results for all of these offsets. Now, in, in the case of spin, and we could, we, I mean, we can go into the physics of a spin measurement if you want or not. I mean, it would take a little, you know, to describe stern gerlach magnets. But anyway, you've got an apparatus. It has, it creates a magnetic field that's 
pointed in a certain direction and you can adjust the direction. That's really all you need to know. And you need to know that you set up a state where if Alice and Bob measure in the same direction, whatever it is, this way, this way, this way, if they set their devices in exactly the same direction, they always get opposite results. If, if one, one's particle will be deflected up and the other one's particle will be deflected down. You can't predict from the quantum state whether which one will go up and which one will go down. Half the time it'll do this and half the time it'll do that. But all the time they'll do something different. So you get these perfect correlations. That sets up a situation exactly like EPR. Bob, if he knows Alice is measuring in the same direction, Bob, when he sees his outcome, can now predict with certainty Alice's. Mm -hmm. Let me let me just write down sort of what you just said. Um, so now we're we're in the setting of Bell's uh, theorem, and sort of uh, let's just call it setup right now. And uh, we have Alice and Bob. We now have our entangled wave function, and uh, it's such that let's see how how do I want to write this? But um, so let's just write size the sort of the uh, entangled wave function. And uh, I guess following the notation of Bell's paper, uh, Alice and Bob can each perform a measurement. Let's say Alice will uh, say measure spin in, as in the A direction and Bob in the little B direction. So these are, these are arbitrary vectors in, in R3, yeah. right? Uh, uh, unit vectors, right? Um, and uh, the point is that w w whenever, um, B is set equals to A, uh, right? So let's call let's call the um, let's see. They're going to measure spin. But actually, let me let me back up here. So so the, right. So this is what they uh, this is the outcome of a spin uh, you know measurement for Alice in the direction A and then likewise for Bob. And the point is that whenever B is equal to A, then there's this perfect correlation right. that happens, anti-correlation. They always get the opposite, sort of like our, our heads and tails uh, example yeah. earlier, right? Yeah. So, so now there's basically an infinite family of perfect correlations for every unit vector A. Um, uh, whenever you choose B, also that same unit vector you get the exact opposite result. Right. Yeah. And, and so by the same argument that EPR gives, if it's a local theory, right? If, if, if Alice's laboratory operation has no influence at all on Bob's particle or the outcome of Bob's experiment, then the outcomes have to be predetermined for all directions at the source because you get the perfect correlations in any direction. If we look at Bell's paper, right? Okay, let's do that. Let me, let me pull it up now. On the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox. Yep. Just read the, let's just read paragraph one. Introduction. The paradox of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen was advanced as an argument that quantum mechanics could not be a complete theory, but should be supplemented by additional variables, right? That's just, if it's not complete, then there are additional variables. That's just by definition. These additional variables were to restore to the theory causality and locality. Now, causality is determinism, but as Bell later said, the main point was to restore locality. And the only way you could restore locality locality, if you have these perfect correlations, is also causality, that is determinism. In this note, that idea will be formulated mathematically, right? So the, the, the what they were trying to do to restore locality will be formulated mathematically and shown to be incompatible with the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. It is the requirement of locality, notice, right? Not causality, which is the determinism part. It is the requirement of locality, or more precisely, that the result of a measurement on one system, it be unaffected by operations on a distant system with which it has interacted in the past, 
that creates the essential difficulty. I mean, he Bell couldn't be clearer than this. <laughs> but the problem is if you don't know EPR paper and you haven't thought about it, this goes by too quickly, right? He's taking for granted what EPR have already proven. And now he's going a step further. Um, there have been attempts to show that even without such a separability or locality requirement, no, quote, hidden variable interpretation of quantum mechanics is possible, right? This is von Neumann and elsewhere. These, um, these attempts have been examined elsewhere. That's his earlier paper, which is called On the Problem of Hidden Variables in Quantum Mechanics. That one was published, that one he wrote before this one. And this is because he was thinking about this. Can I supplement, can I do what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wanted? Can I actually carry that out? And found wanting. That is, he says, the there have been these things claimed to be no additional variables proofs. They don't work. And read the earlier paper to find out why they don't work. There are different ones. None of them work. Von Neumann's doesn't work, right? All the other ones, they don't work. Moreover, a hidden variable interpretation of elementary quantum theory has been explicitly constructed. That's Bohm. So he knows they don't work because there's a counterexample, right? That particular interpretation has indeed a grossly non-local structure. This is, this is characteristic, according to the result to be proved here, of any such theory which reproduces exactly the quantum mechanical predictions. Now, everything of, of what Bell is doing, what's been done before, how this relates to what's been done before is in that paragraph, everything. It's there, it's clear, it's unambiguous. You just have to read it carefully. What I'm gonna do is show you that the attempt to restore locality, which EPR had already proven gives you the necessity of determinism, cannot be carried through. No local theory can reproduce these predictions. Quantum theory was obviously to Einstein non-local. That's what he always complained about. I mean, quantum theory as exposited by Bohr, he always complained it was non-local. He said it has spooky action at a distance. It has telepathy. It has this weird thing. I can't believe it, right? To Einstein, it was obvious that standard quantum theory was non-local. I'm going to, you know, Bell says, I'm going to prove every theory has to be non-local if it's going to reproduce the predictions, statistical predictions of quantum mechanics. He says, um, it, it is this is characteristic according to the result we proved here of any such theory which reproduces exactly the quantum mechanical predictions right in all cases mm -hmm. including in these new cases that einstein never thought about and and bohm never thought about i mean everybody you know they were thinking about these perfect correlation cases where bob and alice are measuring in the same direction and you might think well, let me look at the, the the furthest they can get apart. Let Alice measure in X and Bob at at right angles in Z. But that doesn't give you anything because then there's no correlations. Then they're completely, the results are random and uncorrelated, right? It would really be like you and me flipping coins, right? A fourth of the time we both get heads and a fourth of the time we both get tails. There's no, the, the, the real trick is to look at the correlations in the in-between thing where these are offset by an amount, but not, not by 90 degrees. Now, in fact, for, for, for Bell's case, all you need to do is imagine a situation where Alice, let, let's call this zero. Alice and Bob have, have a device. They can measure, each of them can set their device in one of two orientations. They can both set it at zero, in which case they're gonna, certainly gonna get opposite results. Alice can offset 30 degrees this way, Bob can offset 30 degrees the other way. So either they're measuring in the same direction, they're off by 30, or they're off by 60. Just, just that is enough to set up the situation if you want to do it the way Bell did it with a, an entangled pair of particles in a singlet state. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go through that proof. That, that's given in many books. It's a kind of statistical proof. And what he shows is that unless what Alice does affects Bob's result or what Bob does affects Alice's result, you cannot get the predictions of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Let me let me write down a few things here because I think we said a lot of things and it might be hard for people to um, absorb all that. What is Bell's theorem going to uh, arrive at? We're going to get a Bell inequality, which is a constraint 
on local theories. Okay, and here's the key thing. This, is, this has nothing to do uh, with quantum mechanics. It's just a very right. general mathematical result. Now, right. you can apply it to quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics does make certain predictions, but that's, yes. the, that's an application of it. That's not, net, that's not part that's of right. the it's, inequality. The, so the I just theorem to, yeah. is not about quantum mechanics. The theorem right. is about any local theory. Right, but, you, but, but, it, but in, in sort of the fact that we're using spins and working with certain numbers, that's, that's the application right. of the inequality, but it's, right. not, it's not central right. to, to its formulation. Right. right, and all this talk about spins and so on, which again, we could go into more details, but as far as anybody needs to know, all you need to know is Alice and Bob each have, it's actually a magnet. We're imagining they can orient it in one of two ways. And whenever they do an experiment, they get one or one of two outcomes, which we call spin up or spin down. It essentially means the particle is either deflected up or down relative to this magnet, or you get a dot on the screen that's either here or here. How that works doesn't matter. All that matters is Alice and Bob have two choices, you know, one, one choice out of two to make, and whatever they do, there'll be a definite outcome, which we can call either up or down. And that when they happen to set their devices in the same direction, they always get opposite outcomes, right? Then, then you get a perfect anti-correlation. Mm -hmm. I can say all that without mentioning quantum mechanics, right? You know, you, you could throw quantum mechanics away tomorrow. It would still be the case that you can build these magnets and you know, do this stuff and get these dots. That's just, that's just a description of the experiment. It's not a theoretical description at all. It's just a description of the, the, the experimental condition mm -hmm. um, and the experimental outcome. So it has no, th it, it, it bears no theoretical weight, right? Except that you think, well, yeah, magnets, you can, you can put them this way or put them that way, right? Sure, sure. Uh, and dots, they either occur here or they occur here. That's it. Sure. Let me, let me just write down Bell's inequality. We're not going to go deep. Yep into it, but let's just, let's just finally write it down because we've been sort of uh, verbalizing things a lot. So Bell's inequality, let me just write it down and, and the algebraic steps are in the paper. They're not that enlightening. So I'm, we're not going to go into the details, but if you just, um, well, let me just write it down what, what it's, uh, right. So now here, A, B, and C are, are these arbitrary uh, unit vectors and R3. And the, the only assumption was essentially this, this thing I had, um, ah, I didn't write down what P was, sorry. So P of A and B are just exactly the, these correlations. I'll just write it as an expectation because essentially all that's going on are that you have uh, Alice and Bob, you can think of them as just random variables. They're, they're, they're random variables that depend on the, de the detector settings, right? So you, you pick a setting A or setting B and what Alice and Bob each get are random variables. And P is the correlation between those random variables. Um, and essentially the only, the only constraint that we have is uh, let's say P of AA equals minus one, because as we noted earlier, um, whenever Alice and Bob choose the same direction to, with which to do a spin measurement, they have perfect anti-correlation. So that expectation is minus one. Um, so unless I'm missing any other uh, implicit assumptions that basically as long as you have random variables that are valued in plus or minus one, the outcome of, which you can think of as the outcome of spin experiments, um, yeah. but they don't have to be interpreted that way. But as long as you have plus or minus one uh, random variables that have this perfect anti-correlation whenever the two measurements are aligned, then you have this inequality that I've written here. And this is, this is Bell's uh, inequality, right? And the point is that if you reason about this, even though it's not that clean mathematically, we'll look at a cleaner example in a moment. If you reason about this in the instantiation of the case in which A and B happen to be quantum mechanical experiments, then with some effort, you can derive a contradiction, thus um, showing that quantum mechanics cannot be local. But that, that's, that, that's a, a separate issue than formulating the inequality itself. Yeah, I mean, we, we've gone, right. We've gone so far in the direction of doing this for a pair of particles in the spin state. That if you don't mind, let me just take five minutes and say what you just said in a concrete example. Sure. 
think anybody can follow very easily. So, so again, we're going to imagine this situation. We create a pair of particles in this quantum mechanical state. It's called the singlet state. We don't really care what it's called. Well, all we care is what it predicts. Alice either sets her device at zero or 30 degrees. Bob sets his device at either zero or minus 30 degrees. Okay, so at the end of the day, either they're in the same direction, they're off by off by 30 or they're off by 60. So the top part of this grid, this is going to be, this is going to be Alice. This is going to be Bob. Okay. On okay. the bottom, we're going to have these entries. The, the, the entry here for zero degrees is going to mean, remember, we, we already know because Alice and Bob get always the opposite results at zero degrees. Those have to be predetermined, right? That was the whole point that the, you know, it can't be anything random or how would the other one, each one know? So we have Alice and Bob at zero degrees. They always get opposite results, right? Now it turns out, we'll, we'll call these results up and down. It turns out it's not really important here that they actually on each side just look random. They each get up and down half the time, but they're always, they're always opposite. So you say, I want to, I want to pre-program particles to do this. So this is, what I have here is this is pair of particles, sorry, one, two, three. I'm sending out these pair of particles. And so for pair number one, let's say I'm going to say, well, Alice, if she measures at zero, it's going to be up. That means Bob has to be down. Her next one will be up. That means Bob has to be down. Then her next one will be, sorry, down. So Bob's has to be up and so on, right? I just randomly put in a row for Alice and then the opposite row for Bob, right? However, mm -hmm. I will. All right. Up down is now plus or minus one, but okay. Yep. Yeah, that, that corresponds yep. to plus or minus one. Yep. That gives me the perfect anti-correlation. The only way to get the perfect anti-correlation when they measure in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose Alice happens to set hers not at zero, but at 30 degrees, okay? And Bob sets his happens to set his at zero. So now we're comparing this row to this row. The prediction is, they'll again get opposite results, not all the time, but most of the time, in fact, 75% of the time, okay? So what I wanna do is put in here things for Alice, such that if I compare 30 to zero, they agree 75% of the time. So that means there are only 25% of these can be changed, right? So in other words, I'll, I'll just put same, meaning it's the same as for zero degrees. So this would be up, same, same, then change, then change, then same, then same, then same, right? Whatever it is, I can only change, I need to change exactly 25% because I wanna go from 100% anti-correlation to 75%, yes? And then the same thing, if, Al, if, if Bob goes at minus 30 and Alice is at zero, I want 75% anti-correlation. So again, I can only change, I need to change exactly 25% of these. Randomly distributed, doesn't matter, right? So change, same, 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 change. So if it's same, then that means this would be a D, D here, this would be a U here, and so on. Now, here's the key. If, if everybody's following me so far, I've only changed 25% going up, and I've only changed 25% going down. So no matter how I did that, at least 50% of the time, I didn't change either of them. Yes? Mm -hmm. So at least 50% of the time, they have to disagree. But when you check, when Alice is at 30 and Bob is at minus 30 and you have a 60 degree difference, they only disagree 25% of the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, they what quantum mechanics predicts and what happens is they agree now 75% of the time. They disagree only 25% of the time. So yeah, I think uh, they, um, let's see. The exact formula is um, cosine, cosine squared. squared. This is the, uh, mm -hmm. the disagreement rate, right? Yep. Right. right, so when it's zero, it's one. That's right. And then when it's 30 degrees, that's uh, co um, right. Cosine squared of that. Okay. So, so when this is, when this is 30, 
right? This will end up being three quarters, right? So disagrees mm -hmm. yep. uh, 75% of the time. Yep. 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 And, and when it's 60, 60 degrees, it's one quarter. That's all. That's, right. that's the math. Mm -hmm. Now you, you can just see, you can't put U's and D's down on this so that they always disagree when you compare zero Alice to zero Bob. They disagree 75% of the time when you compare Alice zero to Bob minus 30 or, or Bob zero to, to Alice 30. And they disagree 25% of the time when you compare minus 30 to 30. It just can't be done, mm -hmm. right? If you only change 25% going up and you only change 25% going down, you still have 50% no, you know, that yeah. have, to, have to be the way they were originally. It, it can't be done. So in a way, the math is that simple. Now, in this case, you have to look at these long-term averages. And, and you have to assume you're making random selections. Whenever Bob and on every run, what essentially Alice and Bob are doing are taking a random selection out of this graph. And you're just saying, you can't set up this graph. I don't care what you do. Put U's and D's however you want. You can't set up this graph to give me those statistics. This is an instance of Bell's inequality. Or I mean, Bell's inequality how's... would say, you know, the, the implementation of what you wrote down as the general principle would be because the 0, 30, you know, correlation is 75% is, is as it were, anti-correlation is 75%. And the 0 minus 30 is- Oh, is I see what you're saying. That, you know, it, it, it the, the one for 30 minus 30 has to be at, at least 50%, right? That's where the, hmm. that, that's where the- I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is. Let's pause here because I think people who haven't thought about this for, or maybe not, aren't, aren't so clear about the significance of what we just did. So basically, um, if you um, look at this setup in terms of spin, um, the statistics that you described were encapsulated by this formula I had here, this cosine squared formula, right? The point is that by simulating trials of ups and downs or plus or minus ones that are uh, attempting to be consistent with these statistics, um, you will end up getting uh, inconsistencies as we did with the 60 degree separation and and that yeah. inconsistency uh it was very subtle but that inconsistency was due to the fact that we did not allow communication between the results right. of a and b we, we tried to do it sort of independently so to speak without right. any communication and, and then we just saw that it failed and what, and, what, and what we assumed is that alice's result cannot depend on what bob measures that's exactly right can't that's depend right. on bob's decision to either do zero or 30 and and Bob's result can't depend on Alice's decision to either do yes. zero. Let me just make this. So basically, this is this is bright red line here that says Bob has a trial, Alice has a trial at zero degrees, and then the thirty degrees, uh, the plus and minus thirty degree outcomes uh, only can uh, refer to what Alice or Bob are doing respectively, because again, Alice and Bob right. can't communicate, and when you right. are constrained by that. Then when you compare Alice and Bob again at the 30 and minus 30, you get a contradiction. Right. The assumption yeah. is just that what happens in Alice's lab is independent, causally independent of Bob's decision and what happens in Bob's lab, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Causally independent. Now, of course, they could be correlated because the correlations were already set up at the source. I mean, it's not, again, right. it's, it's just silly to think it's not as if Einstein thought oh, you've got a, co a correlation, you must have a, a spooky yeah. action at a distance. Of course not. His right. whole point was, no, I can get correlations without spooky action at a distance, but only by predetermining the outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so let's just uh, say, so the correlations are this zero, these two zero zero rows yeah. here. That, that was the perfect anti-correlation. Right. And then from going to zero and 30, that was essentially using the blue formula and, yes. and the fact that A and B don't communicate. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Beautiful. Obviously, yeah. if, if what Alice's particle does can be sensitive to what Bob, how Bob sets his device, then we can't even write in a row, like we, we can't write for a row, well, what will Bob do at minus 30? We would have to divide that and say, well, if Alice measures zero, then say he'll get up. And if Alice measures 30, then he'll get down, right? <laughs> But then you just make his outcome explicitly dependent on Alice's measurement choice. That's spooky action at a distance. That's tele that's telepathy. That's yeah. the very thing that that Einstein doesn't like. You know, I hadn't thought about these statistics. At, in, in, I knew it was like you know, 
very simple fractions in mathematics, but I just never wrote it down in this kind of yeah, yeah. nice I, table. I, I mean, it's, it's, think, it's actually quite nice. Yeah. I think this presentation I learned out of Nick Herbert's book, Quantum Reality. I think it's in mm. there. I mean, I've, you know, it's, this is not original to me. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is okay. because what Bell was actually thinking about was these correlated pairs in singlet state. This is what mm -hmm. he first comes up with in the examples. Now, eventually, Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger realized that if you look at triples of particles, you can do something even niftier, right? So what we're going to do now is look at an even cleaner example of statistical results you cannot recover from any local theory. That's the deal. Um, we're going to, instead of looking at a case where we have two particles that we start off in a state and send to Alice and Bob, we're going to have three particles that we send to Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So we're just going to uh, put them on our, in space-time, in labs that are separated. And again, as far as the theory goes, they can be separated as far as you like. The experiments can be done at space-like separation so that even light couldn't get from any one of these experimenters to any other before they do their experiment. We At the center of all this, we have a little device that's producing triples of particles in a certain entangled state, it doesn't matter what it is, and sends them off to Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And then Alice, Bob, and Charlie, again, each one is going to do a spin experiment, which means they've got a magnet. And th this time, instead of it being 0 and 30 and 60 or something like that, it's really either, say, z direction or x direction. It's a, some direction or a direction at right angles to it. We'll call them z and x. So Alice, you know, she's going to choose to either measure in z or measure in x. Bob is going to choose either to measure in z or measure in x. And Charlie is going to choose either z or z or, or x. These choices can be made by them in any way you like. They can flip coins. They can use lotto balls. They can uh, use, as, as Bell says, the parity of digits of pi starting at the millionth digit. So plus any string of plus ones and minus ones that are random in any way you like, they can use. They need, none of them knows what the other one's doing, okay? So under those circumstances, since there's a binary choice made by Alice, a binary choice by Bob, a binary choice by Charlie, there are eight possible global conditions when the three particles come in, right? Which are obviously, they could all measure X, which we would represent XA, XB, XC. Alice could measure X and Bob could measure X and Charlie could measure Z. Um, or just Bob could measure Z or just Alice could measure Z. I mean, this is going to get a little boring, but okay, it's just combinatorics. Or uh, let's say Alice measures X and both Bob and Charlie measure Z and so on. Now, I'm, I'm not going to really bore you by writing all eight. There are obviously eight possible global configurations that can occur. And the nice thing about this case is we don't even have to say, well, 75% of the time you'll get this and 25% of the time you'll get that. We don't have to use anything like that. We can only say things that happen 100% of the time, right? So these are perfect predictions and they involve the kinds of perfect correlations that allow you to say what's going to happen. Given any, now, any two of the outcomes, you can say what the third one is going to be, okay? Now, the only cases we really care about are where all three measure X, or where two measure Z and the other measures X. So really down here, the case where Alice measures X and the other two measure Z, the case where Bob measures X and the other two measure Z, and the case where Charlie measures X and the other two measure Z. Um, so there, there are four more cases, but we don't care about them because there, there, there will be predictions for those cases, but they don't come into the argument. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just maybe make, make a few comments because this looks maybe a little coming out of nowhere, but basically 
behind all this, th there is some entangled state with all uh, for all three of these uh, observers. Um, and you can think of A, B, and C again being binary random variables because spin is valued in plus or minus one, but it's set yeah. up in such a way that even though all three are individually independent coin flips, 50% plus one or minus one, their joint distribution, however, are not independent. And it's such that if you had set your uh, measurement configuration, remember each random variable, it depends on this direction. Uh, and in this case, we only need two, two elements, uh, X and Z for our directions. If you choose the three sets of measurements such that they're all X or one of them, exactly one of them is X, then their joint distribution is such that any two of the measurements determines exactly the third one. That the is third, a property right. of, these, of these probability yeah. distributions. And, and we can show that because, but just by saying what the predictions are, because they're very simple to state. Mm -hmm. In the case where they measure all three X's, the prediction is with certainty that you will get an odd number of up outcomes. Okay. Now, the, it doesn't tell you that number could be one, it could be three, but that we don't care about that. It certainly will be odd. It'll be either one or three. You won't get two, you won't get zero. Okay. And because that's made with certainty, if I know two of the outcomes, I know what the other one has to be, right? Because if, if, if the two I have are ups, then the third one has to be an up to make it odd. Or if the first two you know, if the if the first two is one up, then the the last one has to be down because it has to stay odd. So again, you have the kinds of perfect correlations, which means from Alice's and Bob's outcome, you can predict with certainty Charlie's. From Bob's and Charlie's, you can you know predict Alice's, whatever. And it's those perfect outcomes that again, if you say that what happens in any of these labs has no causal effect in any other lab, then you can make those predictions without disturbing the third lab, right? You can, you can find out from Alice and Bob what they got and now predict Charlie without disturbing Charlie because all you need is their outcomes, yes? So if, if they happen to all pick X, then the predictions are you'll certainly get an odd number of ups. If they happen to pick one X and two Zs, then the prediction is, certainly you'll get an even number of ups. And again, of course, if you know two, you know what the last one has to be. Sure. That's Maybe, it. We, yep, yep. Maybe just a small finicky thing. Should we change yeah. ups to downs? Because I think of up as plus one and, and uh, down as minus one. I think it's cleaner when you think about uh, <laughs> right. Sure, sure, it's sure. Not going to change the argument. You want I know, to I know, I know. But, okay. but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do that. All right, uh, even number yeah. of downs. Yeah. Because in terms of what we wrote in terms of Bell's, the, 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 the notation in Bell setup, right? We, we talked about uh, when we're going to take um, expectations of, of products of variables, then we want to multiply things and either plus or minus one. And so in this case, basically in, in, in this setting here, what we're basically saying is that, um, uh, okay, go, going back to Bell's not, uh, notation, you could think of A of X, B of X, and C of X as being minus one, because we can think of up as plus one and down as minus one, right? Again, these are up or down or plus or minus one value random variables, but if mm -hmm. we're gonna do arithmetic, we should do plus or minus one. So that's that's this case. And then in the second case, then uh, let's say A, X, B, Z, C, Z will be one. And, and likewise yeah. with the three other cases, right. or the two other cases where there's uh, exactly one right. X. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Right. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll work out however you yeah. want. It's yeah, sure, fine. sure, sure. I just wanted it, to, it's to just, yeah. you know, it's easy enough to hold in your head. Yeah. All three X's in this case will say odd number of downs in the other case where there's one X and two Z's, even number of downs. Yeah. yeah. Now, by the reasoning of the EPR paper, if there's no spooky action at a distance, then from the results of any two, I can predict with certainty the results of the last one without disturbing it. Because if it's local and the two of them do their results, get their results at space-like separation, and you say, look, they, they, what they did can't make any difference. What they chose can't make any difference. The outcome that they got can't make any difference. 
I can now predict without disturbing it what the third one will get, then the third one has to already, there has to be an element of reality that determines what it'll be, right? I mean, it can't be random. <laughs> How could it be random if from looking at what Alice and Bob got, I can tell you for sure what Charlie's going to get. There can't be something random going on in Charlie's lab, right? You wouldn't always get the right, right. result. Exactly. Good. This is the three so coin flip version of the thing we did earlier. It's just, I have three exactly. people, two people, EPR. right? Yeah, yeah it's right. just the EPR criterion of reality under the assumption that by separating Alice, Bob, and Charlie, we causally isolate them from each other, right? We causally isolate their choices about what, how to orient their magnets and the outcome that they get. What, what happens in one lab can have no influence on what happens in another lab. Mm -hmm. Now, if we do that, now it's very nice. Now you say, okay, so in a local theory, I have to be able to predetermine what the outcomes would be in such a way as to respect these statistics, to, to respect these requirements. And the, the nice thing about this is you can set this up in a beautiful diagram. Again, this I think was, was invented by David Merman. And it's just extremely pretty. You can show this to somebody. Mm -hmm. And you say, all right, this circle here, that's what Alice, the result she'll get if she happens to set her magnet in the x direction this is what bob will get if he happens to set his this is what charlie will get if he happens to set his in the x direction then z for alice over here um z for bob over here and z for charlie here so th that's all there is right <laughs> that that each, each Alice, Charlie, and Bob each has two choices. The nice thing about this diagram is that the situation where they all pick X's, sorry, the situation, maybe I'll choose a color here. The situation where they all pick X's is this axis with the red dots. And the situation where one picks an X and the other one picks a Z is this one, this one, and this one mm -hmm. right so nice symmetric little diagram and so what is what what do the predictions say they say well if they happen to all pick x we need an odd number of down outcomes right so in these three circles again here here and here i have to put an odd number of d's and on the other rows, the ones connected by blue lines, I have to put an even number. Yes? So now the first thing to do is just try. Right. I mean, let's just try something sure. at random and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I yeah. need an odd number along the red row. It's one or three, just for fun. Let's make it three, because that's easy. So I'll put D, D, D. So now if they happen to pick all Xs, we're safe. This ZC in the middle, uh, it, 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 not, nothing's required here. I'll just put a U in there. Again, we're just trying something. Mm -hmm. But now we start to, the constraints start to bite, right? So along this row, I need an even number. I've got a D, a U. I'm forced to put a D here. And now the I only have this one circle left, but I'm screwed because to have an even number coming down this row, I've already got two Ds. This has to be a U. But to have an even number coming down this row, I have a D and a U, it has to be a D. Mm -hmm. So I can't, right? There's no way I can finish it so that no matter which triple they happen to hit on, I'll get the right result. Now you might say, well, okay, try something else. I mean, you just made some random choices. But then there's this beautiful argument of Merman's. It says you can't do it. There's no conceivable way to put U's and D's in these six circles, and that's all there is to do here, that satisfy all the requirements at the same time. Why not? Here's the argument, it's by reductio. Suppose you could do it. Suppose you could put the U's and D's down in such a way that you get odd along that one and even along the other ones. So pick up the three along the red, throw them in a hat. You just threw an odd number of D's. Then pick up these three, throw them in a hat, even number. These three, throw them in a hat, even number. These three, throw them in a hat, even number. 
So odd, even, even, even. I now have an odd number of Ds in the hat, but I picked up every disc twice because every single circle is on the intersection of two of these rows. So no matter what I do, I can't get an odd number, right? If I pick every one up twice. So it's just easy to see. You can absolutely convince yourself. There's nothing up my sleeves. There's no hidden anything, right? You just, it's just a simple mathematical fact that you cannot put U's and D's in these six circles that satisfy all four of those constraints at the same time. So that means no matter what you do, there's some chance if it's a local theory, if, if what Alice gets, if she measures X, for example, is independent of what Bob and Charlie decide to do, then there's no way you can pre you can prearrange this so it'll always give you the right results. It can't be done. But it always does do that, right? I mean, nature, then, then you say, well, let's go check in the lab. What does nature do? Answer, nature does what quantum mechanics predicts. Nature does always give you an even number in this case and an odd number in those cases. You know, so nature is doing something that no local theory can do. Therefore, nature isn't local. That's it, right? The experiments, the experiments, which originally were done on like the, the, the bipartite case that we talked about, you have to go to the lab and check. You know what quantum mechanics predicts, fine, but that's not the issue. The issue is what does nature do? And the answer is nature does what quantum mechanics predicts. It violates Bell's inequality. It gives you results that cannot be replicated in any local theory. Even if it's on entirely unquantum mechanical ground, I mean, it doesn't matter. Again, quantum mechanics kind of drops off to the side. The issue is locality. Can you come up with a local theory that'll make these predictions? Answer, no. This is what happens in reality. So real physics can't be local. Mm. Actually on this, no, okay. Um, let's see. A few, maybe, actually, let me make one comment here that was uh, maybe implicit, but just to help our viewers. It was very important that the choice of which measurements to make, the, you know, all X's or one X, um, that is not known in advance. Right. And therefore, yeah. all the constraints have to be satisfied because, uh, well, you, uh, since you don't know which, which choice is going to be made in, in order for it to be... Uh, satisfied in general, it has to satisfy all, right. all of the constraints. Right. right. So right. on the one side, of course, if you knew from the beginning, oh, Alice is going to check this, Bob's going to check that, Charlie's going to check that, then of course, trivially, you could arrange to give a good answer. Right. But you don't know that, right? I mean, and if, again, if you think of all the different ways that, that those decisions could be made, how could, you know, you can't prearrange it, you know, there's no way that anybody has the information about what they're all three going to be, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's the 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 the, the uh, there is you know I've said from the beginning and maybe this is the right time to bring it up. The main thing that Bell keeps saying is the the fundamental principle that's kept sacred is locality, right? No action at a distance, mathematically. The, the only mathematical assumptions that go in is the mathematical expression of that, which is to say that the probability of Alice getting some outcome can't depend on what Bob decides to do. But then there's another one, which is called statistical independence. It says that, that essentially these choices are random choices that Bob and Charlie and Alice are making with respect to the the state of the particles coming in, right? In other words, if I prearrange, what you see from this diagram is that if I prearrange these, then there must be at least one of these experimental conditions that it would get wrong. And the assumption is that these experimental conditions are being chosen completely randomly. At least occasionally you'd hit the bad one, right? I mean, if, if every time they come in, one out of four would go bad and you keep doing this randomly after a while, you'd hit a bad one and you'd get a bad result. Now, you know, someone can say, no, 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 no. It, they just never hit a bad one. It's true that there's always at least one that cannot be prearranged, but they never actually choose that one, right? They always miss that one. 
And then you think, well, this is just crazy. Why would they miss it? I mean, by what mechanism would they miss it? By what, what would keep them, right? What would, they're flipping coins or they're, you know, they're using the digits of pi or whatever to make these choices. What's going to somehow magically steer them away from the bad choice every single time, right? Um, so this, there's this second assumption called statistical independence. Bell writes a nice paper about it. Uh, after this comes out and people are looking for every loophole they can find. And they say, look, you're making this assumption that the, that the choices that are made are statistically independent of the state of the incoming particles. And Bell says, yeah, I mean, that's the assumption that underlies pretty much all scientific experimentation. If you deny that, then you can do anything. I mean, if you deny that, then experimentation just does you no good, right? As, as we say, it, it's the same way I always like to say, the, the, the tobacco people really would like to deny that smoking causes cancer. And so you say, well, what's the evidence that it does? Well, the gold standard evidence is a controlled experimental random trial where you take a bunch of rats and you randomly assort them into two groups and then expose one to smoke and then don't expose the other to smoke and treat them otherwise exactly the same. And then see, do you get more cancer over here than over here? Now, someone could say, yeah, but you know, maybe these rats that got cancer, they were all predisposed to get cancer. And it just happened when you sorted them, you put all the certain to be sick rats over in the you know, experimental group and all the certain to be well rats over in the control group. And you say, wait, I just sorted them by flipping coins. I just sorted them by the digits of pi, right? How in the world, you know, no, you're saying no matter what I do, no matter how I set this up, always the sick rats are going to go this way and the, you know, not sick rats are going to go that way. And you'd say, of course, as a logical, purely logical point, you'd say, well, that would explain the outcome without the smoke having anything to do with it. But that would undermine all of scientific method, all experimental method, right? Then you could never draw any conclusions from any experiment. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's so desperate. And you have theories that make these predictions. They're non-local theories, but they're not conspiratorial. They don't involve, they accept statistical independence and they actually account for these results, but they do it in, by non-local means. These exist. People, some people are so upset about non-locality that they're willing to literally grasp at any straw to avoid the conclusion. And I just don't get it. Of course, you know, I'm a philosopher. We read Descartes and you say, well, gee, maybe, you know, maybe we're all asleep and dreaming. Maybe no experiments are ever done. Maybe it's all, you know, maybe we're all plugged into the matrix. And after a while, you shrug your shoulders and say, okay, fine. But then you're not doing science anymore, right? If you're going to entertain skeptical hypotheses at that level, then you're not, you're not engaged in the scientific activity anymore because you're, you're involved in situations where you're saying science can't be done, right? You can never find out about the world. If you're plugged into the matrix, you can never find out about the world because no matter what you do, you're just going to see whatever they've programmed into the computers, right? You have no access. So of course, logically that's possible, but then give up on science, right? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I guess we've, uh, you, you just summarized the two, uh, essential assumptions of Bell's theorem, locality yeah. and statistical independence. Um, uh, maybe there's, there's uh, at least two more things I, I wanna cover. Um, why don't we step back a little bit and summarize what the Nobel Prize uh, confirmed, what, what kind of experiments did they do and which inequality did they, they well, they, they were testing the yeah that so that's easy to they were testing the original Bell one the one we talked about where you just have a pair of particles in a singlet state or a pair of photons you can do it with photons mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. um, what's the trick about it? Well, first of all, you need the two labs to be far enough apart, and the experiments be done fast enough for the thing to be its space-like separation. That is that 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 the as it were the the choice of which experiment is done. On, on Alice's side, even light 
a light signal couldn't carry that information over to Bob's lab fast enough to have any influence on his outcome. Oh, is this the zero 30 minus 30 set of experiments? Yes. Okay. So there, there you would say Alice's choice of either 30, zero or 30 and Bob's choice of either zero and minus 30. Those have to be made so quick. Now, of course, that means really quick. If you're doing this in a lab, you know, there's so much time okay. for light to get from one side to the other. What, 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 Aspe did, which was really clever, because it's, of course, much too fast to actually reorient a device. So we set up two devices, one set, as it were, at zero and one set at 30, and then set up a really fast optical switch. He was doing photons that can send the photon either to this one or to that one. Okay. And this has to do with polarization, not spin. Yeah. And this, this is you're checking instead of spin, you're checking polarization, but it's the same thing. Either the photon gets through or it doesn't. There's a binary response. Right. You've all, all that's important is you have two settings and you have a binary response. Right. So he sets up these optical switches to make these decisions, as it were, unbelievably fast. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there, there are some there were some technical loopholes in the early experiments. The, the detectors were not perfectly efficient. So a lot of these photons would just go missing. They wouldn't show up because, you know, the, the detector efficiencies aren't great. And if if some of the, the photons go missing or some of the electrons go missing, it, it creates a technical loophole where you could actually manage in a clever way to get these results in the recorded data with a local theory. So one thing you wanted to do was improve detector efficiency. One thing you wanted to do was move the labs further and further apart. So now Zeilinger is doing these down on Tenerife between different islands, you know, that are kilometers apart they're not within a lab or you know and you're sending you're sending these entangled pairs and they're going to do it up they do it up in space right i mean you can you can keep stretching the labs further and further apart and you can keep improving the detector efficiencies and and thereby get rid of these loopholes and so that's more or less from the earliest experiments were done by clauser um because he was a he was told by Abner Shimoni, who was one of the first people to appreciate Bell's paper, hey, these are interesting experiments. I mean, we know what quantum mechanics predicts, but nobody's checked. And so Clauser did the first kind of much more simple experiments and Aspe made these quick optical switches and then Zeilinger kept stretching these further and further apart and improving detector efficiencies to where nobody questions the experimental, the fact that nature violates these inequalities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the the kind of technical loopholes have all been filled by now. Mm -hmm. You just, you have to somehow account for nature's ability to give you these results. And as I say, it, it, the, only, the only things that go into the theorem are locality, Bell locality, and the statistical independence condition. And, and denying the stati statistical independence condition, first of all, nobody has an actual theory that does that and makes these predictions. It's just a kind of vaporware. Well, if I deny that, that you know, if somehow, <laughs> you know, if somehow these aren't really random selections, but, you know, th then you're in such a cloud cuckoo land of fantasy that you couldn't do physics anymore. <laughs> the right thing to do is just accept the result. I mean, you know, suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um... Let's see, actually, I think this might be a good place to transition to one of the other things I think we should definitely yeah. talk about are, is misconceptions around Bell's theorem, right? So we, we, yeah. um, we uh, I, I know uh, hidden variables is kind of a dirty word for you, but we did see it explicitly in, in Bell's paper when we were looking at it before. He does use the term, and so do, so do yeah. uh, follow-up papers. Um, maybe this is a good point to clarify in what sense it is a le legitimately used and what in what sense it's not. And where, so yeah. the, the right term, and this is, again, Bell will say in the right place, the right term is just additional variables. Why? That connects to the EPR paper. The EPR paper was exactly, is the quantum state complete? If it's not, then there must be additional variables, right? You can give me the quantum state of the system, but if the quantum state is not complete, there must be more to it physically than that. Those are additional variables. Bell at one point says that the term hidden variables is a piece of historical silliness because if there are these additional variables, they better not be hidden. I mean, that's his point. It's, it's those variables that are actually giving you the outcomes and the outcomes are not hidden. If the outcomes were hidden, so, so what is the outcomes? The, what is a correct 
usage of hidden like you know so there must be some know. correct usage i don't i don't know <laughs> i think what i think that terminology comes in when people by, by people who think the real issue is determinism indeterminism so they're thinking oh if it's really deterministic then whether you get this outcome or that outcome must be determined by some variable you don't know about because quantum mechanics only makes statistical predictions. Mm -hmm. So call that the hidden variable, the thing that determines the outcome. Uh -huh. But in, in something like Bohm's theory, these additional variables are particle positions. Sure, right? sure. So in the sure. theory, you actually have particles. They have, and those positions are not hidden. They better not be hidden. They're the kinds of things you actually see. Like, sure. did the cat liver die? Well, if you know where its particles, what its particles are doing, you know whether it's alive or dead. Yeah. That, they're they're a non-hidden part, right? It's as a, as it were the quantum state or the wave function that's more or less hidden, harder yeah. harder to get your hands on. Maybe I should say. Let me just write this out since we're talking about it. Um, I I in that regard, I I would say, okay, if you if if you accept this as a as a reasonable definition of a hidden variable, which is basically a variable that you just marginalize out then I think Bell's usage of the word hidden variable is justified because that's exactly what he does. He has this lambda and he marginalizes it out. And that's, it doesn't appear anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand in that calculation, you, you, you I, I mean, you, you take the statistical, you do your statistics by summing over them. Mm -hmm. you, you could say that, but again, if you, if you, if you think about the, the main example of a theory that adds these additional variables is this pilot wave theory of de Broglie and Bohm. And there, the additional variables, the things that are not nailed down by the quantum state are particle positions. And to say that those are hidden gives you entirely the wrong idea about how those particle positions connect to what you literally can see. They are kind of what you can easily see um, when you look around you, right? You can look at your cat and see whether it's alive or dead. Mm -hmm. In this theory, what determines whether it's alive or dead is what the particles are doing. So that's what you can easily see. So, you know, one could have a puzzle. Well, why should I add additional variables anyway if they're hidden? It must be for some, you know, I don't know, metaphysical reason or something because they're hidden. I mean, I can't see them. Why should I care if they're there? But then you don't understand when you get beyond Bell to the more general question of understanding quantum theory. And this is one of the things you wanted to talk about. You need to understand how the theory connects up to experience in general. And that means you need to understand what is and isn't really visible. Hmm. Right? Literally what you can see and what you can't see. And, and there the term hidden variables will give you entirely the wrong idea okay. about how these theories work. Yeah, so I think, okay, so I think Okay, this is this is helpful. I th um, if we're if we're to be the most charitable to the people who use the word hidden variable, let's just say they really mean extra variable and extra yeah, just kind of encompasses. It. Okay, okay. If you do, if you just did that, then it, it that carries no more connotation but something not coded up in the wave function. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, there was this other actually point that uh, might be a little contentious, but uh, we've discussed uh, uh, um, outside this interview, which is that um, some people also claim that part of Bell's theorem is this assumption called local realism. So we know what locality is, but there's realism. And my interpretation of that is um, if we think about quantum mechanics, right? Uh, in the Copenhagen interpretation, there's no fact of the matter about the outcome of a measurement until you perform the measurement, the wave fun function collapses. But before then, there's no fact of the matter about what uh, the value of a measurement is. The mm -hmm. realism assumption is that there is this extra variable lambda that determines the measurement for, you know, for, for, um, for all time, as it were. I mean, okay, that's not, yeah. right? So, so, yeah. so, it, it, and so when you look at Bell's paper, he does write down, you know, A of little A of lambda, things like that. So, so it at least seems superficially like he's introducing this assumption right. of realism. So can, can you respond to that? Or how, how do you want to think sure. about that? I, I can respond to that, but I, because I already have. What you just described, the right word for it is the word you used. It's determinism. And as Bell said, yeah, he does assume determinism, but not because it's a fundamental assumption, but because EPR had already proven as a theorem that a local theory has to be deterministic, right? 
that was that's why I say you have to start with EPR. If you've got perfect correlations and locality, that forces determinism on you. So the problem is when people say, oh, that's just an assumption of Bell is if you can deny it and you're out of the woods. No, you can't deny it. If you deny it, then you're back in the woods with just the EPR correlations. You don't even have to go as far as Bell's inequality. If you deny determinism, you can't explain the perfect correlations. Mm -hmm. If you've got a local theory. Yeah, I that see. That was okay. what we said earlier on, Lo mm -hmm. right? Locality plus perfect correlations imply determinism. So if you deny determinism, you have to be either denying locality or denying the perfect correlations. Now, you better not be denying the perfect correlations because those are predictions of quantum theory. So that means you're denying locality. So you're already sunk. Yeah, okay. I'll have to think about this more uh, offline. I, I, I understand the words you're saying. I think I'm just, um, uh, as with many things, it, it takes a while for it to kind of sink in. Uh, I, I, what's puzzling me right now is that uh, there is a historical fact of the matter about how Bell wrote his paper and, and his position in relation to EPR. Now, if I were just to scrub all that and just do the bare mathematics, uh, I nevertheless do write down, you know, A of, uh, you know, lambda. And I'm just trying to figure out if you just forget EPR, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, and just think about it in terms of math, it does seem like the notation suggests that it's an assumption. You, you, you see what I'm trying to say? I, I understand what you're saying, but again, I've, I've already read the relevant quotes from Bell. One is when he, he's talking about EPR, when he says, I can't get across to people that determinism is not an assumption of EPR, but a conclusion, right? It's an inference. They don't, I mean, if you just started out yeah. saying, well, I'm going to assume we have a deterministic theory, then somebody's going to say, well, so what? I don't think we do have a yeah, deterministic yeah, but, theory. Yeah, but I think, I think it's irrelevant. Let me just start it, with They don't, they assume locality. Sure, sure. I guess what I'm trying to say is think of it as a relay race, right? So so you're saying EPR ends with determinism as a conclusion and yes. uh, uh, um, Bell picks up the baton yes. and starts with that. But all I'm just saying is that if you only saw the end of the relay and not the whole thing, then it right. looks like it looks like Bell picks up the assumption when in reality he 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 picked he it up as a conclusion. He inherits, he, he conclusion. inherits it. Yes, he, in, he inherits he inherit not an assumption. He inherits a conclusion. No, 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 he inherits a conclusion which becomes a quote unquote assumption. In you see yeah, what I'm saying? You, or if or you start call it an assumption at that point. You've missed right. Okay, or let's okay. Assumption is maybe not the right start, starting point. His starting point is determinism, yes. which looks superficially like an assumption, but when you backtrack and look at the whole pipeline, right. it becomes inheriting right. a conclusion. Right, and that's why, as you say. You know, the paper is called on the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox. And I read the entire introductory paragraph where he tells you this is as far as EPR got. They, you know, I'm going to show you that they, they showed you already. If you want a local theory, it's got to be deterministic. I'm now going to show you that even then you can't get all the predictions of quantum mechanics, right? But you just have to read that first paragraph carefully. I mean, yes, if you if you thought that that Bell is starting out of nowhere, but what more can he do? I mean, he <laughs> says it's on the EPR paper, and he tells you in the first paragraph what he's taking from the EPR paper, and and then he tells you later, you know, EPR do not assume determinism; they infer it. He can't be clearer, right? I think it's just people who don't. Again, people don't like the conclusion. So they want something they can deny. And they say, oh, I'll just deny determinism. Now I'm home free. Now, whatever Bell wrote has no relevance because he assumes determinism. Whatever he proved as a theorem doesn't apply to my theory because it's not a deterministic theory. That's what millions of people have done. But it just completely misunderstands the dialectic here. And he insists over and over again, what's held sacred is locality, locality, mm -hmm. locality. Try to make a local theory. You will soon find you're forced into determinism and then you'll okay. soon find sure. that doesn't even, even even with that you can't get you okay. can't get all the results you want. I see. We've talked a lot. I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, maybe just one uh, one final thing, if, if there's nothing else. How do you think about uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics? Because there's several. There's also many worlds which we, we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, how, do you do you have anything to say about interpretations of interpretations of quantum mechanics and and uh, and you know how Bell's theorem uh, plays a role yeah. uh, in it, if I mean, at all? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I'll say what I always say. I hate the word interpretation because it sounds like quantum mechanics is some theory, which is then further interpreted. But that's not right. There's no. There are different theories. Okay, there's quantum phenomena. You can talk about the predictions of standard quantum formalism. That's fine. Um, there are quantum phenomena, which are the kinds of things that 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 those that standard predictive stuff predicts and turn out to be correct in the lab, as far as we can tell. But there's no. There just is nothing that would count in a proper sense as a theory that you'd call quantum mechanics. You have different theories that are trying to account for these phenomena. And there's a general argument that I've given that I think is perfectly correct, which says that there are three things you'd like to hold. There are three principles you would prefer to hold. But you can't have all three. As a logical matter, they are mutually inconsistent. Right? You can't have all three. You can have any two, but you can't have all three. And what that means is you can then, any approach to this, the first thing you want to do is identify which one of these does it give up. Right. So let me just state what they are. The first one is the very one that EPR is worried about. Is the quantum mechanical wave function complete? That is, if a system is described by a certain wave function, does that capture all of its physics? Or... Contrarily, could you have two systems described by the same wave function, but that are nonetheless physically different, right? So that's one question. The, certainly Bohr wanted to maintain, Heisenberg wanted to maintain the quantum description is complete, and Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen were arguing it isn't complete. So that's question one. Question two, once you've got this wave function, how does it evolve? In particular, does it always evolve by Schrodinger evolution, which is a linear unitary evolution, or does it sometimes not evolve by Schrodinger evolution, which is what we normally call the collapse of the wave function, which instead of being smooth and deterministic and linear is stochastic and sudden and wildly nonlinear, okay? So, okay, that's a binary choice. Is it always Schrodinger? Or is it sometimes not Schrodinger? Most people would like it always to be Schrodinger because as soon as you say, sometimes it collapses, you then have to confront the question, when, you know, how, how do these collapses occur? If you, again, if you say the wave function is incomplete, then you're confronted with the question, well, what else is there? Give me the additional variables, right? The third thing you'd like to believe is that when you do an experiment like Schrodinger's experiment on the cat, it has a unique outcome, right? You start with one cat, you end with one cat. And the cat you end up with is either alive or dead, period, end of story, okay? <laughs> um, that seems like a kind of basic assumption of all experimental science, that when I do experiments, I get an outcome and there's one outcome and I know what it is and I can collect statistics and so on. Now, the problem is you can't hold all three because if the wave function is complete and it always evolves by Schrodinger evolution, then in a, in a setup like Schrodinger gives with the cat, it won't end up in a state where the cat is either definitely alive or definitely dead. So you can't have all three. The pilot wave theory gives up one. Okay. Because the wave function is not complete. There's in addition to the wave function, if you want to describe a, 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 the situation of a system, you have to tell me where the particles are. You have to give right. me the particle configuration. You can't read that off the wave function. Yep. But the wave function does always evolve by Schrodinger evolution, and experiments have unique outcomes, right? Sometimes the cat ends up alive, and sometimes the cat ends up dead. And there's a definite fact at the end of every experiment whether the cat you put in, the single cat you put in, is alive or dead, mm -hmm. okay? So pilot wave gives up one, keeps two and three. Okay. Objective collapse theories like Girardi, Romini, Weber, or the sort of thing that Penrose wants to do, take wave collapse seriously as a physical change. So sometimes the wave function doesn't evolve by Schrodinger evolution, it collapses. And that collapse is both sudden and indeterministic and most importantly, global. It's not a local thing, okay? 
So they can try and maintain the completeness of the wave function and they get unique outcomes because the outcomes are determined by the collapses. Mm. But they give up on the linearity of the evolution. Mm. If you want to keep the complete GRW, Girardi, Romini, and Weber, objective collapse theory, this is also true of Philip Pearls, has a, a continuous reduction theory. Roger Penrose talks about an objective mm -hmm. reduction theory, an OR theory, mm -hmm. he calls it. Those take root two, right? They give up on two. Okay. If you want to keep the completeness of the wave function and the linearity, then you've got to give up on the uniqueness of outcomes. That gets you to many worlds, mm. right? I do the experiment. I start with one cat. I end up with a million cats or a billion cats or an infinite number of cats, some of which are alive and some of which are dead. Where does Copenhagen fall into this? Copenhagen falls into this as not being a clear theory. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay. They're just not clear enough about what they're doing. Despite it being textbook quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah. Now, now Bohr says, well, let me say one thing. Bohr says the experimental situation and the experimental outcomes have to be described in classical language, which means he's not going to go with many worlds. He thinks of necessity, you have to say, I set up the experiment this way and that cat, it ended up alive. Period. End of story. So he's not going to go that way. And he seems he insists on the completeness of the wave function. That's why he didn't accept the EPR paper. So they're kind of as a logical situation, rather forced into a collapse theory. And that's what von Neumann, when he writes mathematical foundations of quantum theory, it's explicitly a collapse theory. He says the wave function can evolve by two completely different equations. Sometimes it evolves in a nice, smooth, linear way. When? When you don't observe it or you don't measure it. Sometimes it randomly collapses in a very different way. When? When you measure it or observe it. Well, that puts the measurement problem right at the center of your physics, because then you're going to say, well, when? Do, what counts as a measurement? You're telling me that this fundamental difference in physical behavior depends on whether I'm doing a measurement. What counts as doing a measurement? Now, you know, Einstein comes along and says, can a mouse do it, right? Can a dog do it? What constitutes a measurement? If you don't tell me, I mean, this is the measurement problem as it appears in that tradition, because they, they're they really collapse theories. I mean, if you ask me what they are, what they have to be, although they wouldn't forthrightly admit it, they're collapse theories. But when you ask, but when do these collapses occur? They say, oh, when you make an observation. And then people go nuts quite rightly and say, well, when is that? Who has the special ability to make observations, right? So I would say that's really what they're forced into, but they're not happy about it. Hmm. On this note, uh, maybe we can finish up with uh, where do you fall on this spectrum of uh, uh, pick two? Well, I I I think uh, I think the many worlds thing has all kinds of just conceptual problems. Even understanding what you could mean by probability, because if Every time you do an experiment, you get every possible outcome. What does it mean to say there's a 50%, you know, a 75% chance of this and a 25%? I mean, it has all kinds of problems. I find it kind of, I'm not at all, I, I don't see what you get out of it. Um, I, I, I think the kind of pilot wave thing is much cleaner. I mean, this is the same thing, Bell, when he goes through these, he says that the, the Bohm theory shows the finest craftsmanship. And I think that's true. You write down two equations, you write down the Schrodinger equation, and you write down the so-called guidance equation for the additional variables. They're both just equations. I mean, in the non-relativistic case, they're nice first-order differential equations, give you all the right predictions. What more do you want? It's a non-local theory. I mean, the main complaint against that theory from the beginning was it was non-local, but that was before Bell. And after Bell, you want to shrug your shoulders and say, okay, it's non-local. So what? We know the right theory has to be non-local. So that's not, it's not a reasonable complaint. Um, to me, the collapses don't feel right. I mean, I don't like this. I certainly don't like this idea of alternating between Schrodinger evolution and then this collapsy evolution, right? This kind of jumpiness. But it's a theory. I mean, it's worth, it's worth taking seriously. It's worth working out. It makes slightly different predictions because of the collapses. 
Um, Bell writes a nice paper about that called Are There Quantum Jumps, where he's expositing the GRW theory. He writes a nice paper about Bohm called On the Impossible Pilot Wave, where he's expositing that theory. He never writes about many worlds because he could never make sense of it in a way that he thought, you know, even with something that he could think could be developed. And I guess I'm pretty much in agreement on that. Um, I understand why people are attracted to many worlds because if you do any of the other things, immediately the question is clear. You're adding additional variables, what are they? You're collapsing the wave function, how and when, right? I mean, these are you, you, you take on the obligation to answer those questions. The many worlds is so kind of hard to understand what it's doing and how it's supposed to work that it's not even clear what questions you're supposed to ask, right? <laughs> um, and and so I think it 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 gives the illusion of being clearer when actually it's just it's 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 obscurity is more hidden. Um, the other ones because they make these rather forthright assertions, you say okay, follow up that assertion by giving me more details, and you do, and then you run into some problems, right? You can do it for non-relativistic quantum mechanics with Bohm, but then when you get to relativistic quantum field theory and you get to particle creation annihilation, you have to do something else. You have to make adjustments when there are different phenomena that you're worried about, okay? Um, but they're all non-local. They have to be. You're not gonna get away from the non-locality by any of these three choices. It was a mistake. It's a, it's a mistake that used to be made. I think it's made less that many worlds people would say, oh, ours is a local theory because decoherence happens at the speed of light or something like that, which just doesn't make any sense. I mean, we could go into that. That claim just doesn't even have any content and it's not true. Um, and now people who do many worlds, many of them will recognize, yeah, it's a non-local theory too. But you say, yeah, of course it's non-local. It has to be non-local. It better be non-local, right? That's not a that's not a bug. That's a feature. If you got a theory and it's a local theory, I know your theory's wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, this is great, uh, Tim, and uh, thanks for this uh, overview of the different uh, um, theories of quantum uh, mechanics uh, laid out very cleanly here. Um, any final thoughts? No, I think we've probably beaten everybody into the ground at this point. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I learned a lot. This was a lot of fun uh, hashing out things carefully. Uh, I think it's, you know, very, uh, I think this will be a very re rewarding. Uh, well, it certainly was rewarding for me, and hopefully other viewers will will find that to be the same. Okay, great. Thanks for thanks for putting up for, with me for so long. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>